website. But Bryn, if you could give a brief introduction, then we'll hear from the Attorney General. <clears throat> Good morning, committee. Um, for the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council. Um, if I understand you, Senator, you'd like to have um, just sort of a, a brief introduction to the Good Time program and right and how we got how we went from reintegration furlough to Good Time and the reports that were done that I believe are available, but unfortunately we still don't have the. Um, I know it's hard to hear me, so I'm going to stop my video. Can you hear me now better? Um, unfortunately, um, we need broadband help down here in Southern Vermont. Um, yeah, just a brief introduction of how we went from reintegration furlough to good time and that uh, uh, we had reports from various organizations. Sure. So um, I believe that um, Peggy circulated um, a report an Act 56 report on uh, good time yesterday, which uh, was submitted December of last year. Um, and it had several stakeholders that were a part of that work um, that recommended um, the adoption of the good time program once again. Um, and as this committee well knows, because you've reviewed um, the proposed rule that good time rule proposes that offenders who meet certain eligibility criteria um, would earn a reduction of seven days off their minimum and maximum sentence for every month um, that they served, that the offender adheres to certain um, criteria. And um, part of the justice reinvestment bill uh, that passed last year um, also imposed a presumptive parole, created a new presumptive parole statute. Um, and many of you are probably quite familiar um, with presumptive parole and um, the criteria associated with it, but I thought I would just uh, give a, a brief review of, of, of what the presumptive parole statutes impose. So um, presumptive parole would apply to people who are serving incarcerative sentences for unlisted offenses if they meet certain criteria around good behavior. Um, and that presumptive parole statute uh, takes effect uh, January 1st of 2021. And there were several sort of screening uh, processes set put into place around presumptive parole. So there is an administrative review process that was set up um, to, for, to require the Department of Corrections to screen offenders for their eligibility for presumptive parole. There are several criteria um, around behavior that are, um, are required for in, inmates to be eligible for presumptive parole in the first place. And it also requires the department to screen for certain risk criteria. So it provides that um, the department after conducting these two different separate screenings refer inmates who are eligible um, to the parole board for an administrative review if they don't, if, if those inmates are not flagged for meeting certain risk criteria. And then um, those offenders that the department screens as eligible, but flagged as meeting certain risk criteria are referred to the parole board for a hearing, for a full hearing as opposed to presumptive parole. And then, um, the bill also created several tasks for the parole board to um, undertake as a part of this presumptive parole process. So the parole board is tasked with conducting an administrative review for all inmates that the department has identified as eligible for presumptive parole who are not flagged as meeting certain criteria for risk. And for those eligible inmates who are not flagged as meeting those risk criteria, the parole board can still deny presumptive parole and set a hearing if they if the parole board determines that there are victims that need to be notified and given the opportunity to be heard. Um, and also the parole board uh, is tasked with conducting a full parole board hearing um, for eligible inmates who the department flags as meeting certain risk criteria. So um, there are several, several steps that have to be taken um, under the pr presumptive parole statute. Um, before an inmate can be released under that statute. So um, Senator Sears and I talked about how that might be a helpful reminder for the committee as you go into this discussion about the about good time 
and those uh, reductions from the minimum and maximum sentences. Um, our first witness this morning is uh, the Honorable Thomas J. Donovan, Attorney General, State of the Vermont, and David Shear, Assistant Attorney General. Um, so uh, kick it off any way you'd like, Mr. Attorney General. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Good morning, Senator Sears, and good morning to the members of the committee. Uh, Senator Sears, it's not just Bennington County where we need broad, broadband help and cell, cell service. I get to stand on one leg on a stool on my front porch to get cell service some days. So I think it's throughout the state of Vermont, but uh, the service looks good and strong this morning, at least from my neighborhood. So uh, we'll proceed. Um, uh, as Senator Sears said, uh, Dave Scher, who many of you know, uh, who does a lot of the policy work out of my office uh, has joined me today. But I want to first start, start to talk about the justice reinvestment bill uh, that passed last session and thank the committee for their good work. I think it was a really important bill and I think it was a good bill uh, because what underlined that was to ensure more fairness and due process when it comes to reincarcerating uh, folks who are on supervision after getting out of a uh, prison. As you all know, according to the Council of State Governments, Vermont likely had the highest rate of reincarceration for technical violations uh, in the nation. And so the policy uh, with this bill is something that I supported uh, and I want and I support the bill and I want to thank the committee for their good work. And so what the bill did, and I give the, the, the committee great credit and the legislature credit for this because you took on big complicated issues. Uh, technical issues within the justice system, which are hard. And what some of the changes that this bill achieved were the following. Uh, as Bryn just said, it introduced presumptive parole to move people off furlough status more quickly and put them into a uh, status that brings, a, brings more due process. That's a good thing. Uh, it reduced the number of people on furlough through presumptive parole. Uh, again, that's a good thing with the process as Bryn uh, described. Uh, and it reduced the number of furlough statuses to simplify the system. And I think simplifying the system to make it more uh, understandable and transparent is a good thing. And it, in, it introduced the right to appeal to superior court if somebody's reincarcerated for more than 90 days on a technical violation. I think that's probably one of the most important aspects of, the, of this bill, something that I certainly support, uh, something that uh, uh, imbues due process rights to people who are being reincarcerated. And I think that's gonna uh, obviously enhance our public safety while reducing uh, incarceration in this state, a policy goal that I think we all share. I, I think one issue that I would ask the committee to take a look at to readdress in my office is happy to do some of the, to, to do the work on this and to propose some changes is on the earn good time uh, part of this bill. Um, I, I think that, and I'll take responsibility for this, that I didn't perhaps think as deeply about this part of the bill as I should have, uh, because it comes back to victims. And I think when we talk about good time, and I support good time, I, I just don't support good time for all crimes. And I think what I'd ask the committee to consider uh, when the legislature uh, convenes in January is exempting out certain crimes from earned good time. And that would be murder and sex assaults uh, are the first two ones that come to my uh, mind. Uh, and the reason for that is because, and I say this not as an attorney general, I say this as a former state's attorney uh, who prosecuted these crimes, who worked with victims, and frankly made representations to victims. Uh, I, one case in particular, I know that uh, Ned and Joanna, Joanne Winterbottom have sent this committee a letter. Uh, their daughter, uh, Laura Winterbottom, was raped and murdered uh, in Burlington. That was the state's attorney at the time. Gerald Montgomery was convicted of that. That case did not go to trial. That case was uh, resolved as part of a plea agreement. And I can recall that case. Uh, there's not a lot of cases I can recall over 10 years uh, as state's attorney. Uh, I certainly recall Laura Winterbottom's case. And I recall those, those negotiations and we made promises. 
and the court imposed that sentence. And I think out of fairness, uh, and I think out of process uh, to the victims, I'd ask this committee uh, to reconsider uh, uh, the good time portion of this bill because the justice reinvestment bill is a good bill. I support it. There's a lot of important things, but I think what upon further reflection and talking to folks and uh, recalling some of these cases that I prosecuted, I think if we could consider exempting out uh, certain crimes from earn good, earn good time, uh, such as murder and sex assaults, that would be a good thing. Uh, I think would be something in the interest of justice. I think it would be in the interest of fairness. I think it would be in the interest of uh, consistency uh, and uh, transparency. We, my office is, and Dave Scherer, as I said, is on uh, with us this morning. We're willing to do uh, with Ledge Council uh, some of the research to get you some proposals before January. We can get it to you by the end of this month. There's a couple different ways to consider this. You could exempt out by crime, uh, as I just said, uh, murder, sex assaults. You could do it by sentence, anything received over a, a certain threshold. Uh, or New York uh, has a system where it's by petition. Uh, that's something uh, that we could look and I know Colorado has a similar system, uh, but I think we have to um, uh, consider the, the rights of victims that I know this committee has. Uh, I wanna be very clear about that. I appreciate the work of this committee and I know that you've heard from uh, the victim rights community on this bill uh, while it was passed and I just, uh, believe that this bill uh, and the law is a good one. I, I support it, and there was a lot in it, and it was and there were they were it was the mechanics uh, and the nuts and bolts of the justice system, and it was complicated. And um, I, I think, upon reflection, for me, uh, thinking about those cases, I'd ask this committee and the committees of jurisdiction uh, when the legislature convenes uh, to take a look at the young good time and exempt out certain crimes uh, such as sex assault and, and, and murder. Thank you. Uh, Dave, I don't know if you want to jump in on that at all. Um, I think to add, but happy to answer. David, if you have, a, okay. Um, any questions? And again, um, I know I have very technical difficulties down here. Luckily, in Arlington, they have better service. Um, David, any comments, any questions for David or the Attorney General Donovan? If not, we'll, uh, I wanted to mention uh, Representative Shaw. Thank you, Senator. I do have a question comment for both uh, TJ and, uh, and David. Uh, regarding uh, the good time and as uh, good time peace and the suggestions that TJ uh, is bringing forward. Uh, I, in, in our committee, uh, House Institution of Correction, we struggle with good time, uh, the implementation of good time and when it should be implemented and who should be eligible. We struggled so far, so hard, in fact, when we brought the original Good Time Bill forward, we actually asked uh, a group uh, consisting of many of you to come up with a recommendation on uh, who should be eligible and when their eligibility should start. Uh, you gave us a report, uh, Dave, you, David, you were on that, on that committee. I hope you'll remember. Uh, you, gave us, you gave the committee a report uh, December, just about a year ago now, recommending that good time be instituted uh, for uh, all, off all offenders, basically, who are in custody before the effective date of the program. Uh, I must say, this is the, uh, this, this piece here, and actually we got, we have letters from uh, victims advocacy groups uh, supporting the, the current position that the bill is written. And, uh, and I say, and as I say, our, our committee struggled with this. Uh, we were very, very antsy about um, allowing good time for offenders that had been previously uh, uh, sentenced. Now, TJ, you come forward uh, with a new proposal, and I appreciate that proposal because this piece of the bill has garnered me more emails and telephone calls than I've had in my 11 years on the on, the, oh. on this committee. Uh, 
and most of them, I would say the large majority of them came from people that had loved ones that were murdered, uh, raped, uh, other sexual offenses, and kidnapped. Um, there, and it, it's caused me a great pause to try to understand how we, if, if this needs fixing, how we would fix it and how we would go forward with it. So your proposal is very interesting to me, and I, I, I personally am very, very uh, anxious to look at what proposals you may bring forward to the legislature for possible action. I'm concerned, and I, I, this is probably a mechanical thing that we would have to decide is how we would do this when we have implementation dates of good time. I think uh, the effective date of the, I don't remember, maybe Brent can help me when the effective date of the good time piece comes, uh, becomes effective is January 1, uh, but I'm not sure, Brent, can you help me That's with right. that? The, the rule proposes a January 1 and the statute requires January 1 start okay. date. So there's a mechanical piece that we would have, thank you, Brent. Yep. Mechanical piece that we would have to discuss should, should this committee recommend to the legislature uh, to take, take another look at this. Uh, but thank you for this. Uh, some of the uh, some of the explanations of some of these crimes have been startling, and uh, especially when I talk to folks, uh, it goes way beyond what we see in print. Uh, I want to do this right, and I and I was a big champion for victims' rights uh, when the bill was passed. Uh, thought we had it covered, but but I missed <clears throat> not understanding apparently about the amount of work that goes in for plea bargains and in other issues that happen between you and your, your offices and the courts and knowing what damage we could have possibly have created for some of these folks that did sign off for lesser sentences so they wouldn't have to testify and relive the, uh, uh, their, uh, their, attack, <clears throat> their attack in person. So th I wanna thank you and, and, and for bringing this forward. And, and Dave, I, I'm sure that you had the same trepidation when you were on that committee about how do we how do we bring this forward? So this has been something that we've been dealing with for a long time, and uh, just want to say thank you. I, I appreciate that, Representative Shaw, and um, I appreciate you articulating your concerns. Th these are not easy issues, um, as you well know, and I, I think this, the legislature, the state of Vermont, uh, has, has done a tremendous job. Uh, in terms of addressing issues within our criminal justice system uh, to make it more fair and, and more equitable uh, and more centered uh, on victims through restorative process and, and, and other uh, initiatives. And when I think about uh, policies at times, when we talk about the criminal justice system, when we talk about studies, I think one of the tension points is sometimes these become academic exercises and we forget about the people, we forget about the victims. And that, that when I think about that, um, and I'm responsible for that and I take responsibility for that, I think about the experiences you just articulated as being uh, in the courtroom negotiating uh, a plea agreement and working with victims, uh, working with victims' families. Uh, and it's difficult, it's emotional, uh, it's hard, certainly for victims, certainly for their families, but also too for uh, people within the criminal justice system. And I think that this is a good process of that, uh, of reminding us of that difficulty, of that process, frankly, of those representations that we've made. And um, again, I think everybody acted with the best of intentions here, uh, going towards policy goals that I certainly support, uh, but also need to uh, balance that with uh, uh, the rights of victims. And again, just asking uh, that this uh, committee and the committees of jurisdiction uh, take a look at the year in good time. And again, we would be happy to make a proposal to uh, the appropriate committee uh, this month. Uh, thank you. but. I just want to make clear that we, when we passed the good time and we passed all these, that there was buy-in from the victims community represented by the Center for Crime Victims, represented by the Network Against Domestic Assault and Sexual Violence, represented by the Attorney General's Office and so forth. I think 
what part of what happened here was the way the victims were notified uh, by the Department of Corrections in a blast email set off without the understanding of the protections that were put in place through the presumptive parole process rather than reintegration furlough. I, uh, as a representative of Bennington County, heard from multiple victims of a murder down here in Bennington years ago when the uh, perpetrator <coughs> was released on furlough. And it was his second or third release, and uh, it was got a lot of notoriety because he uh, tore off his ankle bracelet, and there was a wide search for the person. So um, that was part of the reintegration furlough process that we eliminated. So I, I, I think I don't want to lose sight, and I'm, I'm happy to look at any changes to the laws. We do that all the time. I don't want to lose sight of the fact that the way it was explained um, to the victims was not the same way that I think it was explained to us this morning by Bryn in the presumptive parole process. We shouldn't lose sight of that. Is still a protection left for victims. They are able to petition. They're able to have a voice in whatever decision is made by the parole board where they did not have a, have a place to make a decision or even comment when somebody was on reintegration furlough. Uh, the case here in Bennington County where actually a young man who was a former resident of mine was murdered. So I, I just don't want to lose sight of that. Yeah, no, I, I agree, Senator Sears. And um, those folks, I, those, those victims were much more upset by reintegration furlough. Uh, Representative Emmons, you had a comment or question? Well, I, I had a question for Bryn, which is um, a lead off of what Butch was talking about in terms of the, we're under emergency rules right now for the good time. And the formal uh, rules would be going into effect. The goal was January 1st. Um, if we do a change in the good time statutes, we wouldn't be able to, do any of that and complete all the changes through the process, be it going through the Senate, the House, and to the governor for signature until the earliest, the end of January. Um, is there a way to delay the implementation of the rules going into effect January 1st? And I'm asking that because I'm assuming that the final rules would have to go through LCAR to be approved. The, the emergency rules uh, also went through LCAR and the- Right, and, and the, the permanent rules. rules would still have to yeah. go through LCAR. So we could communicate with LCAR in terms of some of our concerns or if we wanna work on legislation that the attorney general proposes, we could let Elcar know that and try to work through the permanent rules or not. Yes, um, I haven't, that is not an experience I have had um, yet, but I know that um, there are other, my, some of my colleagues have, have written letters to Elcar um, asking for a delay um, it would be, you'd be out of compliance with the statute, but um, that's your prerogative, so. Great, thank you. So are there any other questions for the Attorney General, Donovan, and also David? I don't have the agenda in front of me. Who was due next to go? Senator Sears. Okay, Chris. Chris Fino from the Victims um, Arena. Chris, why don't you just introduce yourself for the record, please? Sure. I'm Chris Fino. I'm the Executive Director. Oh, I, I need. I need to say that um, I have this weird uh, loop going on. So I'm going to testify and then we'll be available for questions, but it's 
I don't know how you're hearing me. So we're Chris hearing Benno, you fine. We're hearing you fine Center right now. For Crime Victim Services. We're hearing you fine. Great. I'm so glad. Um, thank, thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important legislation. One of the center's statutory responsibilities is advocating for the rights and needs of Vermonters who have been hurt or harmed by crime. It is in this context that I offer this testimony. Great. Last January, I testified in support of including currently incarcerated individuals being able to earn good time. In retrospect, I did not fully see the unintended consequences this had for victims and their families, especially in cases of extremely violent crimes. Talking with victims and families has shown me that changes to this legislation need to be made. Last January, I also testified in support of tasking the state's attorney's office, victim advocates based in the state's attorney's offices, the, the Crime Victim Service Center, Department of Corrections, and the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence to work together to develop a process for contacting and informing victims of the change in the program and the effect this might have had on time served. Unfortunately, COVID-19 happened and this important step did not take place. The center suggests delaying the implementation of the act to give time for amending it as necessary. There must be a comprehensive plan to update and notify victims personally, not through vans, which may require additional personnel. This method of notification has proven, proven to be very upsetting to victims and their families. Receiving this information via a text, email, or robocall was traumatizing to victims and families, and they had few answers to their questions. This committee may benefit from hearing their experience and the reasoning behind wanting exceptions. As not all victims sign up for notification, signing all victims up for notification at sentencing with, uh, with this opportunity to opt out noti of notification could be a way to strengthen notification. We also need to be mindful of the frequency and type of notifications victims might want. I suggest a study committee be convened to review and recommend that conviction of certain crimes be excluded from the good time rule, possibly excluding the big 12, maybe others, and the method of notification. The committee should include the state's attorney's office, the victim advocates based in that state's attorney's offices, the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services, the Department of Corrections, and the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Thank you for the, your consideration of this testimony. Are there questions for Chris? Thank you, Chris. Thank you. I believe Sarah Robinson is next up. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Sarah Robinson, Deputy Director at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. And thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today on the implementation of the Earned Good Time Program. And I just want to clarify, the Vermont Network did not serve on the committee that developed the legislative recommendations for the eligibility of Earned Good Time, though we've been engaged in many related and broader conversations about both victims' rights and criminal justice reform efforts. And we believe that these are complementary, um, but also, as you've heard from other witnesses, require a careful balancing. And in concept, we have been uh, supportive of earned good time because we know that incentives play an important role in encouraging growth and change among people who are incarcerated. And it's with this understanding that um, we would also like to highlight a few concerns related to the underlying law and the implementation of the new good time program. And our first concern echoes what you've heard from the attorney general and from the Center for Crime Victim Services, which is a bit of this one size fits all approach to the applicability of earned good time to individuals serving sentences for every possible crime. 
And we very much understand that the state's previous good time program was overly complex and it relied on the discretion of the Department of Corrections staff, which um, because it was a very human process did leave, lead to disparities and inaccuracies. And so we very much appreciate the intention to move to a system that removed uh, discretion about time accrual and promoted a, a simplified approach. However, uh, we are concerned and we share the concern with the center and the attorney general's office that uh, individuals serving sentences for murder, manslaughter and the worst forms of domestic and sexual violence earn good time by the same measure and in the same way as an individual serving a sentence for crimes that may have less severe impacts on their victims. And so we would also welcome a further policy discussion about whether just a few of those most serious crimes ought to be exempted from earned good time. Um, and our, our second key concern is related to the implementation of the, of the program. Um, and that is victims' rights and notification. And this past spring, we did testify in the House in um, Representative Emmons' committee about the importance of a victim-centered notification process for earned good time. And currently the Department of Corrections has proposed to use their automated victims notification system to send monthly automated notifications to victims about whether their perpetrators have earned good time that month. Um, and we've heard major concerns from victims about both the frequency and the mode of these notifications. And it's especially applicable to victims whose perpetrators are serving long sentences. So you can imagine receiving a monthly notification about the good behavior of the person that caused you harm could be difficult to begin with, but receiving those reminders over monthly over a course of 15 to 20 years could really be a significant barrier to healing um, for, for many victims. And in addition, this is a, another implementation concern. You know, we're concerned that there's no standard process in place right now for prosecutors to communicate the impact of earned good time to victims when they're seeking their input on potential plea agreements. And one of the primary concerns that we've heard from victims as this process has begun to roll out um, is that when a plea agreement is finalized, it can provide a sense of closure and a fixed period of safety for victims to heal. And you know, we believe that really, regardless of what crimes um, are eligible for good time in the future, victims ought to be notified of the potential sentence reduction if good time is earned prior to their opportunity to provide input through a victim uh, impact statement. And that's a really important part of the process for many, many victims whose cases do move through um, the criminal justice system. Just wanted to reemphasize that we support the efforts of the legislature, this committee, and many other committees to reform the justice system, to reduce the state's reliance on incarceration, um, and to resource treatment and supporting communities. However, all of those efforts um, can really only be truly successful with a careful balancing of victim needs and concerns. And so we very much appreciate the opportunity to provide this feedback today. Thank you. Questions for Sarah? Thank you. Um, next is James Pepper from the Office of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, I might add. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, James Pepper from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, thank you for having me here today. Um, I would just say that uh, our office has participated in several Earn Good Time study committees over the years uh, at this point. Um, at certain times, there was no victim representation on that committee, so I felt the need to take a more direct role in representing victims' interests. However, um, as those victims groups started to be represented on those committees, I was really deferring those threshold questions about whether to reintroduce good time, whether to apply it to the current sentence population, and whether to exempt certain crimes to those groups. Um, and the state's attorneys were more focused on the kind of programmatic complexities of earn good time that might be
Did Pepper freeze or is it me? Uh, I think he froze because I froze. <laughs> More broadband problems. Yeah. Everybody's using broadband. That's the issue. Well, why don't uh, why don't we move to the next witness? If Matt Valerio, I believe, is on, and then come back to Pepper if he gets unfrozen. Are you there, Matt? Oh, there you are. You're muted. If you could. Matt's muted. There he is. Well, I think you can hear me, but uh, this is one of those mornings where I'm not seeing well. So yeah. um, and I think I'm going to have more of those the older I get. Um, in any event, uh, this is Matt Valerio. I'm <laughs> Defender General. I'm, I was surprised to see this on the agenda. Um, given that we had just spent a couple of years going through and fleshing out the issues with this over what I thought was a very arduous and detailed, um, you know, look at the, this issue. I mean, I was here when there was good time off of both ends of sentences and saw it slowly whittled away so that, uh, relatively early on in the Douglas administration, uh, good time went away completely, um, and hence the rise of furlough, um, which uh, served a purpose but had its own issues, clearly. And we didn't even let, we haven't even allowed this statutory change to take effect before trying to roll it back um, and get at the issues, or at least some, it seems like there are uh, segments that uh, are attempting to roll it back. Um, very disheartening for uh, people who are trying to provide some incentive. Um, and it's even for the, the more serious crimes and probably even more so for the more serious crimes. Let me say, I can go into some detail about how good time works in murder and sex cases. Um, and fundamentally, since both of those crimes um, have uh, maximum sentences of life in prison, you're not talking about um, good time off the max. What you're talking about is good time off a minimum sentence if there is a split sentence. Uh, because then that good time, it does reduce the, it would reduce the minimum if the person is compliant and doing everything you, you want them to do in their caseload. Um, and the person would be subject to uh, release on probation um, with their split sentence. If, however, it is a sentence to serve, that person, while they may be earning good time, um, is subject to parole board review. And the parole board is going to make a decision about whether that person is going to get out or not. Um, so it's not like the person is just let out on their own um, after they have uh, um, done a good job in, in prison and uh, uh, without any review by anybody. Um, the, all of these things, in my memory, were discussed over the last period of years in getting this together. I mean, in fact, the proposal that we came up with or that, that was, was passed was one of a, a, a collection of issues that the Department of Corrections came forward with in an attempt to mitigate their, uh, their costs and their, uh, and their results. Um, if, in fact, this revision or look again at, at this uh, um, issue is the result of poor communication um, or, uh, or communication in a, in a manner that uh, uh, upset victims. Um, I get that. Um, and that needs to be resolved. Um, I don't know that you need to resolve. I don't need, I don't think you need to roll back what you spent years putting together that arose out of the Department of Corrections and um, 
impacts uh, an extraordinarily minor, uh, extraordinarily small number of cases in only a subset of those cases. Sentences in, if, if there's an issue of worried that people are gonna get out on their, on a split sentence where they earned, uh, where they've earned their good time and they have an entitlement to be released, um, then uh, sentences can be structured by the state's attorney in their plea agreement to prevent that. This is what lawyers do all the time. Um, in, interestingly enough, most of what goes on in sex cases doesn't have to do with the uh, structure or length of sentences, but it has to do with the quality of the evidence and the ability of the prosecution to be able to prove the case at trial. Uh, when sex cases go to trial, the vast majority of them end up in acquittals. They don't end up in, in convictions. Um, so plea agreements end up getting individuals under supervision um, and get them into treatment and uh, put the uh, state in a position to be able to um, you know, supervise them over a period of time. Um, it's not, uh, you know, the risk is that again, when if there's a lack of incentive is there um, or uh, with, uh, with any of these cases that more, again, more of them are gonna go to trial and more of them are gonna result in acquittals just like what happened the last time um, the, the uh, sex uh, assault statutes were modified. So, you know, I don't, I don't support any, any change in this uh, as, you know, I, I think it was well vetted already um, and it's the kind of thing that can easily be resolved by the, uh, if a state's attorney doesn't like uh, the way a, uh, uh, how good time might apply in a particular case, they can effectively get rid of that good time um, by the way they structure the sentence. Um, and, uh, you know, there are also, of course, uh, and I, I wanted to make this clear, that all sex cases are not the same. I mean, we still have in Vermont, um, life maximum sentences on consensual sex between some teenagers uh, where one of the uh, participants is a minor. We do have a, a, a window where if you're within a certain number of uh, years, um, the, uh, that uh, consensual uh, um, sex is exempted, um, but you can still have people going to high school together um, and uh, be subject to a maximum life in prison um, at, at, with sexual assault on a minor. Um, and so to broadly um, include all sex uh, cases as part of a, uh, an exemption to, to good time if that were to come to pass. And I, you know, I frankly, I think we're a long way from, from that and, and whatever issues that uh, we've heard from the victims uh, group seem to be related to how this was communicated to them um, because all of them had the opportunity to come to the legislature. And I, I was there when, when this was supported and I know that you all were too. Um, I doubt seriously that, that good time would have gone through if they didn't have the support of, of the victims and the like. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's, it's really regrettable that it, it comes to the point where, uh, where, where a, uh, a communication method is the thing that ends up unraveling years of work. Um, the other thing that I would note is that I believe as a matter of law, the inmates who are currently um, in jail, whether they have sex cases or um, murder cases, serving sentences, by virtue of the legislature passing the, uh, the statute, um, have a vested right in that good time until it's repealed. Um, and the, you know, the, for some period of time um, until the legislature works this out, if, they're going, if you're going to do that, um, you're gonna create a, have to create a calculation system to apply the good time for however long it is in place. And frankly, I don't want my office to have to be litigating that stuff if we don't have to. Um, I'm sure that that uh, DOC legal doesn't wanna be part of that either. 
Um, you know, I, 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 I understand that there are always individual cases where um, what a legislature might do in retrospect doesn't seem fair to the particular individual. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm mindful of the Winterbottom case and there's a, some number of other cases, of course, that would also um, be of concern. I understand that. Um, but that is something that I think um, the people working on the bills knew was going to be part of the deal when resolving it. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't something that was, uh, was hidden or unexpected. And frankly, I was, I was expecting more of a kick from the um, victims groups during the time that this was, uh, um, was being uh, vetted by the legislature. However, um, I think that uh, most all of them, from my memory, um, saw the benefit uh, long term of, of doing it this way. And uh, it's, it's just regrettable in my view that uh, if, if this is an issue of communication, then we should resolve that and uh, let the statute take effect. Any questions from Matt? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Representative Emmons is. Um, I'm just chuckling speak? at. I'm chuckling at the dog. The dog had a question. He did. He, he did. did. Um, yeah, he's been rather loud today. Um, as Pepper resolved his, um, are there questions from Matt? And I guess I, I, I'm just one, and it's both you and Pepper. The current system um, seems to me to, to breed some unfairness in terms of the reintegration furlough. Um, having dealt with a case down here in Bennington County that both Matt and James are, uh, are familiar with, um, you know, I, that for victims was much more, um, they weren't even consulted. And all of a sudden, or they get notified that the offender is out on furlough at some place. Um, that system was changed, and that I thought that was the benefit. Um, do you have any comment on that, Matt? Well, I mean, clearly, this uh, the good time system should be going forward a, a more uh, transparent system. Um, you know, I know that furlough from a victim standpoint, it was hit or miss. And I, I think the, the case that you're referring to is one that is probably more of an exception than the rule, but it always seems like we're being driven by the exceptions um, where the, the uh, notification didn't happen in the way that you would, uh, one would hope it would. Um, but, uh, you know, to me, it's more about victims understanding what is going to happen and that their expectations be um, lived up to, um, you know, based upon what the law says. Um, it's always when we kind of get astray of that is when we end up having the problems. I don't know if James has any. Any other questions from Matt? I'm trying to mute myself to avoid the dog talking to all of you. Um, but Pepper, if you're yeah, I apologize uh, for that. I am in Orange County and we have similar problems here. Um, um, no, I, I mean, as I was saying, you know, when you remove the threshold questions, which I feel like were supported by the victims groups that, you know, the, the nuts and bolts came down for the SAs was how do we make sure that this is an evidence-based program that uh, has clear criteria and is easily administered so that victims at the time of sentencing will know exactly what the expectation is and that state's attorneys will know that there'll be sufficient time with whatever sentence they're negotiating or what they're arguing for will give DOC sufficient time to complete programming on the individual. Um, we think that what passed in Act 148 actually achieved that criteria um, you know, we heard sufficient testimony uh, from CSG and we looked to other states about the benefits of earned good time on the corrections population. Uh, the criteria couldn't be any 
simpler or easy to administer. I mean, we actually did a earlier proposal that would include kind of a merit-based system, recognizing that that did lead to issues in the prior iteration of earn good time. But regardless, the system that was devised under Act 148 couldn't be simpler to administer uh, in my view, and it will ensure in sentencing at the time of sentencing. I know DOC has been preparing kind of a information cheat sheet for, I guess, prosecutors at the time of sentencing to say, if this person were to earn all of his or her good time, this is the date that they would be released, or this is the maximum amount of time that would be removed from their min and their max. Um, so we think that the program that passed, you know, again, removing those threshold questions is a good one. However, if, you know, if we're hearing that CCVS and um, the network, if their position is that certain crimes should be excluded or that uh, it shouldn't apply to the sentence population, I mean, we're happy to support that as well. I would just make one note about the communication um, to the victims. And, you know, I know uh, DOC and our victims advocates had an early meeting in September to kind of talk about the messaging and how that would roll out. Um, and I think that DOC, while the message maybe could have been finessed differently or, or but you know, they were under strict guidelines and they met their statutory requirements. Um, and you know, their rule, the rulemaking process had a very kind of aggressive timeline to it. And you know, I, there's comment periods that needed to be held and um, so they had to make the communications that they did. I mean, maybe the message could have been slightly different, but you know, I think that they lived up to what the statute requires. Okay. Questions for Pepper? Thank you, Pepper. I'm glad the technical problems have been resolved. Mary Hooper has a question, I believe, for Pepper. Representative Hooper. Yep, thank you. I was having a hard time finding my hand, so thank you for seeing it. Um, Pepper, I would you could you please comment on if we allowed certain exemptions um, from the statute, what the kind of the consequence of, of state's attorneys charging decisions and kind of the calculation that you that they would go through in terms of trying of, of charging individuals. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not expressing that very well. Do, do you have enough of a sense of the question I'm after? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, I broke up a little bit on my end too. Is, is it about a, you know, how a prosecutor is gonna kind of contemplate earn good time when making a plea agreement? Or, yes, or, or even deciding which crime to charge I mean, I, I, it is my impression that going into the process, there are an array of choices you could make about how you're going to charge this and that this could start driving those decisions. Well, you know, perhaps Matt has some more historical perspective on this, but I, I don't think that this will lead to either charge inflation or sentence inflation, if that's the concern. Um, it was a concern that we flagged in our earn good time report um, that it, you know, this is a possibility, but I don't think that it's one that the prosecutors are actively thinking about either at the charging decision, potentially as it relates to programming or supervision uh, at the plea agreement decision, but I don't, um, or, or at sentencing, um, but I, I don't think that it will impact a charging decision. If we created exemptions. Oh, this is strictly about exemptions? If, yes, yeah, I'm sorry, yes. Okay, sorry. If there were exemptions created, would that affect either charging or plea decisions? I, you know, it, because I think 90, percent of plea agreements are, or ninety percent of cases are resolved by plea agreement or ninety nine percent um, you know I a state's attorney could compensate if they need if they felt they needed to uh, so I don't think that um, it would really change the dynamic all that much if there were exemptions 
Can I, can I ask a, can I do a follow up if you don't mind, Representative Cooper? Pepper, it, the problem is not with the to be sentenced population as I understand it. The problem is with some individuals who are already sentenced and will be under the new construct receiving good time. That I believe is, is paramount. And that's what the attorney general is committed to coming back with a recommendation on. If we were to treat the um, current, uh, currently sentenced population differently from the population that is to be sentenced in the future, would that create constitutional issues? This is the kind of... Uh, well, I mean, I mean if, you, if, if you said that people who were sentenced for um, 20 years to life and more who are currently sentenced would not receive good time, would that create a constitutional issue that they wouldn't receive it, but somebody who in the future might? You know, sentences, sentences for certain crimes change over time. I don't think uh, that, I mean, I think Matt's concern is that there would be a vestment of the earned good time in the currently sentenced population uh, because of the way that the statute was written. I don't see a constitutional problem with uh, having certain, the sentence population um, being treated differently than the future to be sentenced population though. Thank you. Other questions or Mary, what did you? Okay, I, I think um, our next witness, scheduled witness is Jim Baker, Commissioner of the Department of Corrections. Good morning, everybody. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Commissioner Jim, for the record, Commissioner Jim Baker, the uh, Commissioner of Corrections, and uh, I, I like to put in front of Commissioner and the Interim Commissioner of Corrections. Um, I, I, I'm sitting here listening to um, comments, and uh, I, I want to first of all thank James Pepper for his comment um, about the deadline we were up against uh, to make everything that's in Act 148 work. And on the notification piece, this notification piece, as a reminder, was around the emergency rules the emergency rule on good time. And as James said, we met with, with victims advocates, my staff did, putting together a message. And you know, I, I, I don't wanna, I wanna go back to what Attorney General Donovan said, the general talked about, we in corrections support the concept of criminal justice reinvestment. But I'm listening to a little bit of an overtone here about all of this was caused by the way corrections notified people. That's, that's, that's hard for me as the commissioner to sit here and not respond to that. We were under very tight deadlines and we could have just put out a press release and met our obligation, but we did use vans because that's our notification system. Uh, I'm gonna guess, and I don't have the number in front of me, I'd be happy to get back to the committee with the number, but we have somewhere in the area of 7,000 victims. And I, I don't know what people propose that we would have done different to notify 7,000 victims. And, and I, I, I wanna make just, a, you know, I'm gonna say these comments based on someone that has 45 years of history of working with victims. I suspect I probably have as much as more time as anybody that's on this hearing working with victims of crimes in one form or another. And victims of crimes are not exceptions. They're people that have been victimized. And as a reminder, many times at the State House, when we were going through this, I brought up the issue of victims. I talked about it in just about every committee I, I, I was in. I, I, don't, I, I don't have, as the commissioner, I don't have um, to weigh in one way or the other about what you should change and what you shouldn't change. But this, this is not about how people were notified. In fact, when we did the public hearings on the rule, the majority of the victims said they had no idea this legislation was passed. That's the feedback that we got. Now, how to fix it, I don't know, but I, I just wanna make 
sure everybody understands that Corrections is doing everything we can to implement this bill. And to pass this off as if it was some type of communication problem. This is about victims of crimes and what they live through every day. I've had several conversations with the Winterbottom family. And, and Senator Sears, you, you know this because you know they reached out for you when I told them I would reach out on behalf of the Department of Corrections to talk to them. Those conversations were very difficult. And it relives for me all the years that I've dealt with victims of crimes. I've been on the front end of knocking on people's door and notifying that their children aren't coming home as a result of a victim of a crime. And so I, what I don't wanna get lost in this conversation is that there's exceptions to cases and um, so on and so forth. These aren't exceptions to cases. These are victims of crimes. And so I, I don't really have, as the commissioner, we're, we're working way too hard right now to implement Act 148. And we'll do whatever the legislature directs us to do. But I, I do want people to understand that we're doing everything we can to implement the legislation. Now, the first notification on the public hearing for the emergency rule that Representative Edmonds referred to, we could have done a little bit better and we changed it. And I actually went back and checked with victims myself personally. Hey, was the second process better than the first process? And it was. And we could have done a little bit better. But I don't know how we're going to notify 7,000 victims without using some type of uh, electronic notification system. And I guess maybe we could have figured out. But our victim advocates within corrections were working very closely with the <clears throat> And I got to tell you, my, my victim advocates were victimized as well because they take on the trauma that the victims take on. So I, I don't really have one way or the other to weigh in on. Um, what the solution here is, but to remind everybody again, what I talked about several times during the legislative session. We're not talking about exceptions to rules here. We're talking about victims. And so uh, I'm more than happy to take questions, Senator. Thank you. Uh, questions for Commissioner Baker? Um, I have a question. Senator, uh, Representative Emmons. So, <clears throat> right now, we're in the process, DOC's in the process of promulgating the rules. You're putting together the permanent rules in terms Correct. of how the good time program will be carried out. Correct. And during that time frame of putting together the rules, there is public comment that goes into that. Correct. What are you receiving from the victims community of public comment in terms of how the good time program should be structured? Is there an understanding from them that this is a process of putting together the good time program? It has to meet statute, but the rules are to carry out the program. Is there understanding on the victims arena that that's the level that the conversation's occurring? Well, the answer to that, Representative, I'll do the best I can, but I also know that um, Monica Weaver and Dale Crooker are on. Um, we're not, what we got for feedback were victims were very upset that, and overall, the victims had no idea the legislation had passed. So again, um, you know, we try to work through that. The first public hearing we had, um, I'll say it again, we worked on the second one and tried to be a little bit more sensitive to the victim's needs. But we didn't get, what we pretty much got was, number one, they didn't know the legislation passed. Number two, they were confused about what we were doing by having the public comment period because it was an emergency rule. It wasn't, you know, we're trying to move through the emergency rule to get to the permanent rule. And so they didn't really understand the emergency rule and what that was all about. That was number two. And number three, they, they, they were exactly um, in the same arena that the winter bottoms were in when you, the letter that has been sent forward to the committee here um, about, you know, again, having an understanding of how cases got resolved for their victims. And now um, in their mind, it had been um, turned upside down. 
Our job in that rule hearing was not to get into a debate about how the process would work moving forward. It was the public comment about the emergency rule, and we took that public comment. And that's what we heard, Representative. I, I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Any other questions for Commissioner Hager? <clears throat> you have a uh, question, Senator. Yes, Sager. Senator Hooker. Um, Commissioner, you're talking about 7,000 victims. It's a number I've taken off the top of my head. Okay, but 7,000 is the whole universe of victims. Is there sure. a, a subset? Um, the AG had, had suggested exemptions for certain crimes. Do you have an idea of what that subset would be? Well, you know, I, I feel like as the Commissioner of Corrections, you know, my, my job is to run the system that um, takes people into our custody and do the programming and so on. You know, so as the commissioner, I'm not sure I should weigh in what those should be. But as someone that, as I told you, worked with victims off and on for 45 years, I mean, just read the Winter Bottoms letter to give you a sense of where to start this conversation. Um, you know, 15 years later, they're reliving the vicious murder of their daughter. And I'll say it again, these are not exceptions. Um, um, so I think when you got violent crimes and you have violent domestic crimes and you have crimes of sex abuse, we know these are the big issues in the state, right? These are the things that victimize people the most. Now, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, somebody uh, employee embezzles $5,000 from them. Yes, they're a victim of a crime. And they're going to have a, a reaction because they were victimized. But it's, it's not the same situation as those, those, uh, those uh, violent crimes. I don't know where you draw the line. And, I, and I, I wasn't coming here today prepared to even talk about that. But I said what I had to say because I think I needed to uh, make sure folks understand what corrections is role in implementing this legislation is. I know you know it, but I needed to remind folks. Well, my conversations with um, Chris Fenno and then read in conversations with you, Commissioner Baker, and then reading the letter from the Winter Bottoms, and we've received some letters from other, uh, maybe as individuals or as all the committee um, from other victims um, is and I, um, I understand what you said about the notification, um, but <clears throat> as I started my conversation, trying to understand how the current system works and why this system, um, whether we exempt certain populations or not, why this system is more transparent and much easier to understand for both the public, general public as well as the, the victims um, and the offender, to be clear, um, because the current system of reintegration furlough and all the numbers that we're going to hear from David Timor in a little while, um, you know, point to the failure of that system and how we need to make improvements on that. So I don't want to lose that. Um, that we threw out an unpredictable system. Um, and uh, um, I hope you um, can understand that there may have been um, a number of, um, we have a problem right now and rather than fixing blame for the problem, we need to look for some solutions. And right now, I don't have the a, a firm recommendation from the Attorney General <clears throat> who said he will provide us with something. But it's clear that this system is going to go forward because it would be impossible for the legislature to reconvene in January and pass something in time to stop what is most like affecting January 1st. Um, and I guess I'm I'm asking your reaction to that, how that complicates the life of 
Monica Dale and about a thousand corrections. Yeah, I think I'll start and then certainly if Dale or, or Monica want to weigh in on that comment, Senator. So I, I just did get a text. Just to put it in perspective, Senator Hooker, we have 15,000 victims in band because one crime can have multiple victims, right? 15,000. So um, look, Senator, I think any changes at this point is going to complicate the work that's been going on since the, um, the fall um, pretty much full time to implement a team that's working on. You've, you've been briefed on some of this um, last week, the work that's been going on. Um, I think it's going to complicate it. I think I caution us, you know, um, you know, my, my victimology side says to me that we need to listen to what these victims have said. My, my commissioner of corrections side of me says that moving back to a, you know, we're trying to get out of these complicated systems that we've created over the years, right? And I think the trick, and I think the General Donovan talked about this when we kicked this off. This is very complicated stuff that we do. And um, I would not want us to see, get back, back to the point where we're cre creating several levels again, like we had with furlough, right? But I think we've got to make sure we're hearing what the victims are saying to us. So I don't know if Dow or Monica are there. Um, this remoteness and not being in the same room is difficult. I believe we're <laughs> there somewhere. Maybe, maybe. Um, I think you, you see right. Like I, I think as a department, we just implement that the laws and rules that we're required to pass through. Um, just understand that um, the way that the good time has is coming out. It was part of the savings that we're going to capture to do other things to help um, reduce recidivism and things of that nature that create more victims. This, these are very difficult, you know, decision points to have. But every, every the, the system that was passed was very straightforward and it, and it captured um, a way to easily identify and track good times. We've always had these questions about corrections math because we'd had three or four different types of good time rules in the past. Um, just understand that every time there's a change or an exemption or a restriction, it's going to have an impact on the savings that were identified to be captured through justice reinvestment. Um, and, and, and that's fine. Those are decision points that, that the committee is gonna to have to weigh and, and make those decisions. Um, you know, we can work on implementing, you know, just about anything. The more complex it is, the more um, open to uh, legal issues that may come because we're, we're working on multiple types of rules. Um, just the complexity can start increasing and it does open the department. And I think Matt Valero kind of said it earlier, um, will tie us up with litigation um, if we don't do something right. And, and, that's, and that's the reality. And that's what uh, we ran into decades ago um, with the old good time where we had very complicated systems. Um, but, but one thing to, to just be mindful of, if you do set systems up that will have two different types of system, you'll need to, to let us know how you want us to rectify that. For example, if someone, if you wanna say, just for an example, um, anyone before January 1 of 2021 doesn't get good time, you, you make that rule. What happens when someone that's released on the old rules picks up a new charge? You should let us know how you want to us to apply good time moving forward. So those are the complexities that we start looking into. Um, and, and without, um, guidance or direction from the legislator, the department will try to interpret it. And then that also opens us up for more legal action uh, because we may not interpret it the way um, Matt Valerio will, for example. So that's just it. It's, it's very complicated, very emotional. Um, you know, I sat in on one of the hearings, uh, very difficult decisions that have to be made. Um, and Maybe know, we should maybe I, I, this is off the top of my head, so sometimes that's not a good thing to do publicly. But I'm curious as to some consideration as TJ and the Attorney General's Office come up with a 
proposal, it may be that we're better off tightening parole for individuals who have been um, sentenced for uh, certain crimes uh, and making sure that victims' voices are heard in that parole process and that um, rather than undoing um, what might be more complex. So, I mean, I think that's an alternative we need to look at. Is there, you, know, you don't have to react right now, but I think that's another choice is to make sure victims are heard in the parole process of their victim. I, I, their, I mean, their offender, I'm sorry. I think there is avenues in the, in the parole system to allow for victim comment. Also understand just because someone earns good time, the department doesn't have to release an offender that we feel is a risk or a threat to a victim or the public. That, so, you know, Matt can play name hundreds of times you've done that. So just because someone earns their good time, the only time we have to release someone is when they hit their maximum sentence. That's it. Um, anything before that, the department's in control and, and we do um, weigh in victim safety and community sentiment and um, public safety in, in these release decisions. Just because someone is, is eligible for release um, doesn't mean we have to release them. You know, I've been, I've, I've been brought before um, some of your committees on a few times having to explain why we have people pass their minimum. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons that like we have um, the authority and the responsibility, I believe, uh, not to release offenders that we think pose a risk to the public. Uh, uh, Senator Lyons, I think you had a question or comment. Uh, thank you. I do have a question. And I mean, there's so much here. This is, uh, uh, I hear how, uh, as the commissioner has said, the interim commissioner has said, <laughs> uh, for me, the commissioner. Thank, thank, thank you for that, Senator. Thank you. <laughs> um, how very complicated it is. Uh, and I'm hearing so many different comments. Um, but it seems to me that one of the fundamental issues here is communication. And we've heard it's communication with the victims advocates and the victims themselves. And we're also then, and, and as uh, Dale is talking, it becomes clear that if a victim didn't hear the information that you just provided, uh, I would think that you, the information you provided would be extremely reassuring. Uh, to victims, and I don't know whether that message has gotten out. And then at the same time, we're hearing, of course, the question about differential treatment pre-adjudication or during adjudication through the state's attorney's offices. And I'm the, my, my, I guess my question is, will there be any attempt at um, having some consistency and some guidelines that would make consistent recommendations either at the prosecutorial level or um, uh, later on guidance for uh, folks who are making decisions about um, uh, good time and, and how, that, how that'll all sugar off. I know the rules are one thing, but then after rules come process, uh, guide, guidelines, guidance, and, and so on. And so just that whole general area I'm curious about. I'm, I, I'm gonna ask Monica, I think that one of the data points that we're going to be supposed to be looking at, and I see David DeMores on, um, around good time was looking at the inflation of sentencing to see that if sentencing increased based on good time. Um, that did occur with reintegration furlough. Um, and the way that that planned out is individuals kind of got six more months added onto their sentence and the vast majority of offenders didn't get it. So there's almost an inflation in the sentence across the board. Um, so I do believe that's one of the data points um, is, is the increase in sentencing. Um, you know, I think if you look at it as a, you know, a pure unemotional looking at good time, sentencing should not be impacted because it kind of defeats the purpose of the good time, um, if, if that makes sense. So if we're looking to reduce sentences by 25%, that's roughly what it is, seven days a month, but all of a sudden the sentences increase by 25% and, 
it kind of negates um, what good time was meant to, to provide as far as, as savings for the department and, and to reallocate those resources. I don't know if that answered your question, and I don't know if, if Monica has a comment. Or Monica, did you want to comment? I see your hand is raised. Yeah, well, thank you, everyone. I'm Monica Weber. I'm the Administrative Services Director for the Department of Corrections. And um, um, I had raised my hand earlier um, just to sort of, but Dale, I think, covered most of the comments that I wanted to make just related to, um, you had asked a question, Senator, about you know complicating the system and how much how much work it might be for us. Um, I thought it might be helpful um, for people to know, right, the emergency rule will go in, into effect on January 1st. And, and as the commissioner said, we had the public comment hearing for the emergency rule. And then the one that was just a couple of weeks ago for the permanent rule, which had um, a lot of comments. And we are sorting through those comments. It's four hours of, of pretty intense comment that we will prepare and submit um, to LCAR uh, following the rulemaking process. So, um, you know, that work will, will continue as will the work that we're doing to implement and make sure that we can um, follow the statute <clears throat> on January 1st, as, as the commissioner mentioned. Um, there is a lot of um, data that's being required uh, also with Act 148 related to uh, just ongoing monitoring and the uh, success uh, of the implementation overall. I have not seen a specific data point on this particular topic though. And so we, we may need to go back and look at that. I know it came up a lot during um, the phase one of justice reinvestment um, related to earn good time and, and looking at sentencing. Um, I know from my <clears throat> view of the, of the data that that would not be something that the Department of Corrections could really undertake. And we'd really want to make sure that we had some um, support from uh, the judiciary, maybe the Justice Center, and really uh, looking um, at sentencing and how sentencing has changed from pre and post um, good time implementation. I'm happy Thank to answer you. any other questions. Are there any other questions or comments on, on this subject? I think we've, um, anyone who was a witness as well, I, I just want to say thank you for the the, la, the, the well, last set of comments the because it, it is important to have data informed decisions and I think that going about it the way you're uh, talking will help. Not easy. No. no. Um, it would be helpful to me and I imagine to other members of the committee, Bryn, if you were to send out a paragraph of where we're at um, paragraph or two of where we're at and, and uh, in terms of current law, when it takes effect and so forth, so we can better explain to people who ask us questions about this. Sure thing, I'll do that. Thank you. Also, Representative Emmons. I just want to reiterate what Senator Sears has been saying about the transparency of the system. Um, and currently, we have a system of reintegration furlough, uh, different types of furloughs, and those decisions are really made more internally with DOC. Um, and it only becomes available when a person reaches their minimum. And when a person reaches their minimum, it does not mean that they're going to be released. It means it's a review on the Department of Corrections um, side, and they do reach out at times to victims if they deem that the person could be released. Um, I, I think we also have to remember that with earned good time, an, an inmate's not gonna automatically receive those seven days per 30 days served. They have to earn it in that by law, they have to behave while they're incarcerated. And we've laid that out that a person, an inmate would not be adjudicated of major DRs. Um, so there's some onus there to the inmate to have some responsibility <clears throat> to earn those, uh, earn good days. 
So it's not a given that an inmate is going to receive all the good time that they would be entitled to. It's going to be up to them to behave, to earn it. And once they reach their minimum, does not mean that they will be released. There's a review process there. Um, And I think we have to keep that in mind. And I know a lot of folks are watching us right now. And I just want folks to be, um, to know that when a person does reach their minimum, it's not an automatic release. And with good time, it's more transparent than the current system in terms of knowing what's occurring when a person's incarcerated. So I don't want us to forget that. Thank you. Um, why don't we take a three minute break um, till 1030 and then we'll pick up with David D. Mora and the next subject, which is um, some slides. From. Thank you very much. And uh, we now have David D. Mora from the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Um, David uh, made a presentation um, earlier was it last week or earlier this week? It's just um, to the uh, last uh, to the working group of the Justice Reinvestment Two Working Group, and uh, I thought the numbers were um, startling, and the slide presentation was something we should discuss here, and uh, the numbers of people who are returned for violations from furlough, probation, and uh, parole who have either mental health, substance abuse, or or, or both issues is the subject. So um, I'll let David kick it off. Um, You may have to put the slides on the screen, um, which will mean that I can't see everybody. So please feel free to yell if you have a question. David, go ahead. Yes. I. I'll need for someone to give me permission to be able to share my screen. Um, so whoever's control, whoever's the host. I believe you already can... have that. I made you the co-host when you entered. Hmm. Oh, that's let me make you the host. Maybe that's what I have. Yeah, it's not coming up that way. Yep, now I can do it. Just a second. That should be working now. Everybody seeing that? Yes. Great. So good morning and and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to the committee. My name is David DeMora and uh, as Senator Sears indicated, I work with the Council of State Governments Justice Center where I am a senior policy advisor. I have been with the Justice Center for just about a decade now. Prior to that, I spent uh, about 35, 36 years working uh, in the field, if you will. My background is uh, clinical in nature. However, my adult career has been at the intersection of criminal justice and mental health, working with a variety of uh, folks who have committed crime, as well as folks who have been victimized with crime, um, particularly focusing on various areas of violent crime, including sexual violence, domestic violence, and and, uh, general violence, if you will. I'm going to uh, talk this morning about uh, the intersection of behavioral health issues and criminal justice and how that relates specifically to Vermont and some of the issues in Vermont. As I mentioned, I work with the Justice Center. We are a national nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that combines the power of a membership association that serves as state officials in all three branches of government with policy and research expertise to develop strategies that increase public safety and strengthen communities. We bring people together. We drive the criminal justice field forward with research. We build momentum for policy change. We provide expert assistance. Our goals are to break the cycle of incarceration, uh, to advance health opportunity and equity, and to use data to improve safety and justice. What we utilize is what we call a data-driven approach uh, to improve public safety, to reduce corrections and related criminal justice spending, and to reinvest savings in strategies that can decrease crime and reduce recidivism over time. 
The initiative is supported by funding from the U.S. Department of Justice's Bureau of Justice Assistance, or BJA, and the Pew Charitable Trusts. I'm going to uh, I'm going to talk about one section of what we spoke about um, last week, which is specifically the behavioral health report. Um, a few introductory comments I'd like to make. Um, the previous discussion was extremely important, and uh, obviously determinations will be made in terms of how to best approach that. I would like to respectfully suggest that whatever the outcome of that is, that just focusing on that will not get you where you need to go, because we need to look at what happens to people, what happens to people on the inside, and most particularly, what happens to people once they are on the outside? What are we doing and how are we being effective? That's one issue. The second theme that you'll hear uh, as I talk is I'm going to talk about system issues. There's a whole lot of good people that are doing the best they can and in many cases doing very good work in Vermont. But I'm still going to talk about system issues. There is no system in Vermont that can't be improved. Uh, there is no system that can really say that they can't do any more or any better. Uh, there is no system that can say it's just someone else's problem. The complexity of the people that are in the criminal justice system make them uh, the, the problem, meaning the responsibility of multiple systems in terms of being able to positively impact them, to improve their behavior, and to increase public safety as well as victim safety. And so I will constantly be talking about the fact that there needs to be integrated responses and that uh, every system can add to this in terms of improving the responses. I also want to be clear that in some ways, Vermont is a victim of its own success. Vermont has done wonderful things in terms of looking at criminal justice issues. Uh, you have done a tremendous job over the last decade, decade and a half, and, and everyone should, be, should receive major kudos for that. The uh, downside of that is that what is left are the most complex individuals. Uh, the people that are in the criminal justice system, the people that are cycling through the system are easily the most complex individuals that um, us, any system or set of systems can deal with. And so it makes it more difficult and makes the thinking, if you will, a bit more difficult in terms of how, how, do, we be, how do we become effective in responding to those folks. When we look at folks that are entering prison on a supervision violation from 2017 to 2019, what we found um, was that those folks were assessed as higher risk than the overall supervision population. Now, to be clear, risk is not the type of crime. Risk is the uh, potential for somebody to be committing any new offense or to be failing on supervision. And the risk level was determined by the use of the community supervision tool. The community supervision tool is part of a risk and needs assessment suite that is called the Ohio Risk Assessment Suite. And one of those tools is looking at folks in terms of community supervision. What are their risk levels, which means what is the intensity that is needed to effectively supervise those folks? And what are the needs, which means what are the kinds of things that we need to respond to? And when we look at this, what we see is that the folks that were returning were indeed assessed as having higher risk and needs than the overall supervision population. That makes sense that one would want to look for that. That doesn't mean that we can be satisfied at the level of the um, violations, but it does make perfect sense that what you see are people who have greater risks and needs having a higher difficulty and in this case a higher failure rate than those folks who have lower risk and needs. Over 50% of folks entering prison on a supervision violation who were assessed using the prison intake tool report having a previous mental health diagnosis. The prison intake tool is another piece uh, of the Ohio Risk Assessment Suite. 
And so there are several tools in that suite that can be used and that can be used at different points during somebody's uh, involvement in the criminal justice system. But what you see here um, is a significant number of people, over half, uh, reported having a previous mental health diagnosis. That is incredibly significant and important when we talk about the issue of complexity and the issue of responses to those folks in the community. Almost 60% of folks that are entering prison for a supervision violation show indications of a moderate or high substance use need. Um, and this was determined, again, through either the, uh, the PIT, the prison intake tool, or the community supervision tool, both of which have a, a, a set of questions that reach a rating. And if you reach a certain rating, then that would put you in a moderate or high uh, bucket, if you will, in terms of what your substance use need is. And when we look at this, we see about 60%. Now, some of the 50% in the last slide and some of the 60% on this slide uh, can be uh, the same people or they can be unique individuals. Uh, in other words, some people have what's called a co-occurring disorder, which means that they have both a mental health and substance use need. What you see here in particular is a very high rate of individuals on furlough with a furlough violation in terms of um, having a high substance use need. And again, an important point, which we'll come back to uh, in terms of why this is not working. Of the 903 people that were revoked or returned from probation or parole and were placed directly on furlough, from 2017 to 2019, 51% were subsequently returned to incarceration or detention, so over half. Um, and there were a variety of ways uh, folks might have been on probation or parole. There would be a supervision violation, and they might go direct to furlough. Then from furlough, they would end up being detained at 51%, whereas 49 would, be con would continue. And so over half uh, ended up failing. Now, almost half ended up continuing on community supervision. One of the things that we know is that when we look at people with more complex needs, they are more likely to be the ones who will fail if those needs are not met appropriately, uh, whether that's inside a facility or whether that's in the community. And in this case, obviously, since we're talking about uh, people that were uh, had a supervision violation, we're talking about whether or not needs can be met appropriately in the community. Uh, without evidence-based supports on community supervision, folks with mental health and substance use needs continue to cycle through the criminal justice system, regardless of the changes in legal status or increased surveillance. So whenever they get out, the likelihood of them coming back without effective intervention is quite significant. So what you have is this sort of cyclical process where people keep coming back. And there are valid reasons why, given the current state of what is available in the community, it, there are valid reasons why, whether it is a parole or probation officer or it's the parole board, why they determine that the best option for them is to go to furlough. The problem is it's using a hammer to fix a broken bone. Uh, it, it is not getting you what you need because what those folks need in terms of being successful isn't just closer supervision. That may be part of what they need, uh, but they also need a variety of other services and specifically services that are related to mental health and substance use treatment. Act 148 directs the Agency of Human Services to work with us, CSG Justice Center staff, to report current behavioral health assessment, case planning, and information sharing practices. Section 22 in particular directs the Agency of Human Services to provide the following information to the Justice Reinvestment Working Group by December 1, which is the current assessment and screening processes which includes how assessment results inform case planning for people who are incarcerated, planning to re-enter the community or on probation, um, existing behavioral health collaborative care coordination and case management protocols that serve the corrections population, and challenges that exist in information sharing between service providers and the DOC, the Department of Correction. 
Uh, in fact, AHS, with the support of uh, our staff, took a collaborative cost, excuse me, collaborative cross-system approach to gathering the information that's required in Section 22. Um, now, in reality, while there has to be a report by December 1, which was yesterday, uh, there will be ongoing information gathering that is going to be necessary. The amount of information, the amount of work is significant. And so part of the initial report really uh, relates to what else we need to be looking at in the coming weeks and months. And to be clear, when we talk about AHS or the Agency of Human Services, we're in particular talking about the Department of Corrections, the Department of Mental Health, Alcohol and Drug Programs, or ADAP, and the Department for Children and Families, or DCF. And there are obviously other important stakeholders, uh, which include the parole board and the courts, uh, who also need behavioral health information to make critical decisions as an individual moves through the criminal justice system. People with behavioral health needs that are in the criminal justice system really require an access or often require an access to an array of providers and services. And they don't all need all of the different services, but we do know, again, based on the data that a very significant number of people who are currently involved in the justice system need access to substance use disorder treatment, need access to mental health treatment, have transportation issues. Many, many have housing issues uh, and Many need recovery support services just, just to use those. Uh, and of course, po folks who have higher what's called criminogenic need or uh, what sometimes is called criminal thinking also need a correctional programming, which is a, a cognitive programming specifically designed to help folks modify their thinking to a more pro-social way, to ways that are appropriate to live in the community uh, as opposed to ways that turn folks more toward criminal activity. As people in the criminal justice system with behavioral health needs are identified, states need to do more to ensure access to the range of treatment and services necessary to adequately address those needs. Uh, and to be clear, this is an issue that is true across the country. At this point in my life, I've worked in 49 of the 50 states, uh, and these issues are true in many of the states. Uh, in fact, overwhelmingly, I would argue probably almost all of the states. The difference for Vermont is that, in, in some ways, it's a bit of an advantage for you. Because you've done such a good job weeding out, if you will, other individuals, um, the downside of that is you have the most complex folks left. The upside of that is that it actually allows you to focus clearly on that subset of individuals. You are not focusing with uh, the large variety of individuals that other state correctional systems may be dealing with because they have not done the work that Vermont has done over the last decade and a half. In Vermont, what this means is that a person on furlough, probation, or parole may interact with several different providers across departments under uh, AHS. And so some that individual in the middle that you can see, they may be on supervision, they may have behavioral health needs, uh, they could just be on supervision, but in many cases, they also have behavioral health needs, they have mental health or substance use uh, treatment that they need to access. They may have a family service needs because of children and other family issues that they also need to be involved with. And so and you have multiple uh, departments, if you will, that somebody may be involved with when they are on community supervision. And when you think about community supervision, really good community supervision is essentially case management that looks at how to assure a collaborative response and how to assure that there are parameters set. Obviously, there's the issue of community safety, um, but a good community supervision isn't just uh, watching somebody. Good community supervision is assuring that those individuals get what they need in order to be successful. But a community supervisor can only do that to the degree that those things exist or to the degree that they are granted access to what does exist. And when I say access, I mean information and I mean refer referral ability. People need to be screened for mental health and substance use needs at all stages of the criminal justice system, starting at the very beginning in terms of emergency responses and law enforcement, certainly the courts, jails and prisons, as well as probation and parole. 
And for those folks who do screen positive in terms of a mental health or substance use need, at that point, then they will need to be assessed by a trained clinician who can reach a diagnosis. Data must be collected, recorded, and shared. And the and shared is a particularly important piece of that. Uh, the first issue is, of course, it does need to be collected and systems need to be in place to do that. And then secondly, it needs to be shared among the relevant uh, folks uh, that are working with these individuals who are in the criminal justice system. To be clear, there are people who screen positive who when there is a full assessment, it, uh, there's a determination that they may not have some of those needs. Uh, screens are purposely overly sensitive because you don't want to miss anybody. Uh, so you will lose, if you will, there'll be a percentage of individuals who may screen positive, but who upon further assessment, there's a determination that their needs are not as great as the initial screening may have suggested. Vermont, uh, again, to its credit, has most assessment and screening processes in place for identifying substance use and mental health needs as folks move through the criminal justice system. Uh, for those folks that are detained, there's a substance use screener, a mental health screener. For sentence, there's the screeners as well as follow-up clinical assessment as appropriate. Uh, for a low and parole, you see the same. Uh, probation, you see substance use screener, follow-up clinical assessment. Uh, one thing that we don't see in terms of probation is a mental health screener up front for those people going directly to probation. And uh, one of our recommendations is indeed that that needs to be added to the work uh, and that that is information that indeed the court should have as they are making their decisions. And if I can get back to my screen is not paying attention to me, there we go. Uh, there are some challenges that exist to ensuring assessment and screening results inform case planning as well as possible. Uh, now, according to DOC policy, case plans for folks on community supervision are informed or will be informed by behavioral health information that's identified by screeners or and or assessments. However, case plans are not always informed by the behavioral health needs of the client due to resource constraints. Uh, due to court order stipulations that may not match what the actual needs are of that individual, in part because the court may have not had that information and when it was making those decisions, uh, or because of limited service availability, uh, particularly for those under supervision who may be in an area where that particular type of programming doesn't exist, or if the programming exists, that the, uh, the programming doesn't necessarily have the best information to understand how to best respond to people in the criminal justice system. And we'll come back to that. Supervision staff uh, have access to behavioral health information within the reentry case plans uh, to understand the behavioral health needs of folks moving from incarceration to supervision. Case plans for people who don't receive MAT, uh, medication assisted treatment, or who are not identified as having SMI or serious mental illness may not always reflect other types of behavioral health needs. Good news, doing a really good job for folks who need medication-assisted treatment, doing a really good job both inside and in the community for people who have serious mental illness issues, uh, SMI category, if you will. Um, but for those folks who may not reach that level of severity, it's, it's not as uh, solid, it's not, not as good in terms of there being responses to those individuals. And one of the problems with that is that while it may not reach that high level in terms of those particular substance use or mental health needs, those, those lesser but still significant needs, uh, anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, et cetera, et cetera, get in the way of the effective programming for those individuals. So while it may not be a direct cause of their failure, it actually impacts the other kinds of processes that can make them successful and increases the potential for their failure. Assessment and screening results are not consistently shared between the Department of Correction, meaning healthcare contractor, uh, DOC facility reentry case managers and supervision officers and the community-based providers, and in reverse, I might add, from providers to DOC, to inform case management and care coordination. Uh, in other words, there are information sharing challenges uh, that happen between the various agencies, both the agencies within the Agency of Human Services, AHS, in between uh, those agencies and community providers. 
I mentioned that uh, good uh, supervision is essentially uh, being a lead case planner. And this is a visual that talks about that or shows that. Uh, in this case, the lead case planner for individuals who are in the criminal justice uh, uh, system are indeed the people that are the community supervisors, the community supervision agency. And they have a lot on their shoulders. Uh, when you look at all of these potential areas that there may be needs for in terms of their clients, so, so this is a lot, right? You have, of course, just the particip participants themselves. You have their support system. You might have children's service agencies. You may have medical issues. Uh, substance use treatment, mental illness treatment provider, of course, the courts, correctional facility, because there's that relationship, vocational and educational, possibly providers, specialized housing provider, possibly, and peer support. So a lot for a community supervisor to manage. And for every one of those, those uh, blocks in the circle where there's a hole, it makes that job of management and success more difficult uh, for those individuals who have high needs. Now, Vermont does have treatment case planning policies in place, but people are inconsistently connected to community-based services. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, there are challenges to sharing the relevant behavioral health information and coordinating the care between DOC and community-based providers, which can negatively impact overall case planning and subsequent treatment and programming and referrals. And to be clear, uh, the, the agencies or the departments within AHS are working on this and are, are looking at how to have appropriate information sharing, how to make sure that information sharing protocols meet all legal requirements, uh, obviously, uh, and that uh, the information that is shared is the appropriate information. Not everything needs to be shared, but there is re relevant information that can really help people succeed and the absence of that sharing increases their failure. Some of the DSC supervision offices do have very strong relationships with local services and they leverage those connections to help clients connect with the available services. It's not consistent, however, across the state, and it results in geographic variations in, in care coordination. And by the way, that consistency, to be clear, that inconsistency is for different reasons in different places. This is not all on DOC by any means. Um, in some places, it, it may have to do with how a local office operates. In other cases, it has to do with how the local community uh, services operate in their view. In other cases, it's because it just does not exist. And so therefore, there isn't anything to be able to leverage. Due to funding limitations and challenges in care coordination, uh, folks with mental health needs who don't rise to the level of serious mental illness tend to be underconnected to the continuum of care that's offered by the designated agencies for mental health in the community. For people with co-occurring disorders on um, medication-assisted treatment, there's often a lack of coordination for mental health treatment across the providers and supervision. Uh, and, and again, part of my, my theme here here is that there needs to be this, these are complex needs, complex individuals, that's who you have left. You need to have a complex integrated set of responses. It can't be on the shoulders of any one particular agency, if you will. The person's behavioral health information should move with them through the criminal justice system so that it can inform ongoing case planning and decision making. Starting at the court disposition, uh, key information sharing partners there, of course, would be the Department of Corrections as well as the courts. Institutional programming, uh, now you're looking at the Department of Corrections and their healthcare co contractor, uh, of course. Moving to reentry, we're talking about the case managers, the supervision officers, the community-based service providers, and you can see the, the arrows talking about or sort of showing the need for that information flowing back and forth. Again, the appropriate information flowing back and forth. Community supervision, the supervision officers and the information between them and the community-based service providers. For violations and revocation decisions, between the supervision officers, the parole board of the courts, community-based service providers. Again, all of those um, uh, folks need to be involved. And then for parole, of course, the relationship and the information sharing between supervision officers and parole board. Uh, I have, uh, over the course of my uh, multiple visits last year, uh, I've had the opportunity to observe many of these different intercepts in the system and saw uh, really some very excellent kinds of things occurring, but 
it is inconsistent. And I saw situations where uh, the parole board didn't necessarily have information that they should have had in terms of being able to make decisions. Uh, I saw situations where the community supervision officer was doing an incredible job, but was unable to get information from the community service-based uh, provider. I saw situations where uh, their, the um, community-based service providers we're doing an incredible job, but we're feeling frustrated because there wasn't the communication that they wanted to be happening between themselves and the supervising officers. So I saw different kinds of things. And so there are those challenges. And again, I, I don't want to over, um, I, I want to make sure that I'm continuing to say that there are many good things that are going on, but everybody can always do better. And so my job when I was looking at these things was to look at the challenges, to look at where those holes were. And uh, that's what I'm doing. But I don't want to suggest that there are not many good things occurring because there really are. Information sharing ensures that a person receives the type and level of intervention necessary for increasing supervision success and reducing the likelihood of reincarceration. That information, when it's shared, can support collaborative case management and care coordination. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about assessment and screening results, past treatment and programming, current treatment and programming, future recommended treatment and programming. Uh, and, and all of those would be after at the end of the programming, there's always a comma, which would be as necessary or as needed. Medications, if applicable familial and social supports, strengths and challenges. And strengths is very important. We do tend to get stuck often on what the challenges or risk factors are of an individual. Sometimes we don't pay attention to what are the strengths that they have that can be built on. And responsivity factors. And responsivity factors are very simply, uh, what are the factors that could get in the way of this person doing better? Or what are the factors that will help this person do better? And they include things like, responsivity factors include things like, uh, if there are mental health needs that get in the way of them doing better, if there are substance use needs, if there are, uh, for example, difficulties in terms of reading uh, or education, if there are uh, difficulties in terms of uh, being able to apply for a job or knowing how to follow the rules to be able to, to keep a job. Uh, and, uh, and then there are age differences and gender differences and cultural differences. So responsivity factors can be a fairly broad range of factors that if we don't pay attention to them and we assume they don't matter, we respond to everybody in the same way. And then when they fail, we say it's their fault as opposed to looking at whether or not our response was the appropriate matched response to what the needs were. Behavioral health information sharing between DOC, community-based providers, and the parole board is inconsistent across the state. Current information sharing between supervision officers and community providers is generally based on relationship rather than an overall established process or policy. So it varies widely across the state. And to be clear, that policy that we need to think about is a policy that is not, uh, this is not specifically the Department of Corrections policy. This has to be a policy that is across the various components. Uh, right now, AHS does not have an umbrella information sharing policy that governs how its departments share information, but they are working on, they are looking at that. Um, sharing that information to be able to support people with behavioral health needs in the criminal justice system that need to be served by more than one department is extremely important and AHS understands that uh, and indeed as I mentioned earlier uh, has a working group looking at how can this be accomplished, what are the best ways to do this. Um, there are also inconsistencies as I mentioned in the type of information shared between supervision officers and community providers and in reverse to support case planning and case coordination. Uh, again, as I said, in all of these cases, we are talking about system issues and system solutions. Uh, while many folks in all of the different agencies and departments have taken it on themselves to try to figure out how to do this, it puts everything on their shoulders. And to be successful, there needs to be a, a more coherent and collaborative uh, policy response that crosses over across the state, across departments and across the state. For people who are sentenced straight to probation, there's less behavioral health assessment and screening information available to inform supervision conditions than for people transitioning to furlough or parole, uh, or parole excuse me. As a result, judges often don't have the necessary information to ensure that the conditions of supervision 
address the criminogenic and behavioral health needs, particularly for those folks that are sentenced directly to felony supervision. Minimum information that a judge should have to inform supervision conditions include substance use screening results, mental health screening results, criminogenic risk and need screening or assessment results, and criminal history. Uh, and again, depending on which hearing I was sitting in in which part of the state, in some cases, uh, most of that information existed. In no cases did it all exist. And in some cases, very little existed. And to be fair, it, there were also different opinions on the part of judicial as to what they wanted. Uh, but again, I would argue that that's another statewide systemic discussion to be happening in terms of really what is the information we should be assured that a judge always has. Uh, to, and ultimately he or she will decide what to do with that, of course, but what, how do we make a determination that this is what should always be on the judge's desk when he or she ultimately is going to be making the decisions. Now, so some jurisdictions across the country have expanded the use of assessments to inform the setting of supervision conditions. Colorado is doing probation investigations for all misdemeanor and most felony cases. They're referred for probation investigation that includes risk and needs assessment results and recommendations for supervision conditions. Arizona has put together a really nice uh, system of uh, using a preset, what they call a pre-sentencing report. It's for all felony cases are required to receive a short pre-sentencing report that includes risk and needs assessment results and relevant social history. And it's at this point that I need to make the uh, important point that the suggestion is not that everybody gets a full PSI or pre-sentence investigation. The department couldn't possibly manage that in terms of what that would take for time and resources. Uh, but what we are suggesting is that there can be some improvement in the current assessment process to assure that the information on the prior slide uh, does get to the judges. And so uh, something that is uh, fairly short and not uh, time, extremely time, uh, uh, takes an extreme amount of time, forgive me, uh, that because the there are no, there is not that time available in many cases. And in addition to that, even if the court were willing to give that time, the amount of resources that would take for the department make it completely unrealistic. Vermont faces several challenges to improving information sharing and care coordination. Um, there are real and perceived limitations related to federal privacy laws and regulations, as I mentioned earlier, and which includes HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, as well as 42 CFR Part 2. Having said that, uh, generally what I have found across the country and have found in some discussions in Vermont is that there are more perceived limitations than real. Uh, and so again, uh, kudos to AHS for looking at this issue and trying to make uh, some of the best determinations they can about how to improve information sharing and to do so within uh, the appropriate laws. There is inconsistent knowledge among the DOC staff and the parole board staff and other criminal um, or parole board members rather and other criminal justice stakeholders regarding evidence-based practices and serving people with substance use and mental health needs. And it's all over the place. There are people with tremendous amounts of knowledge and information and there are folks that have less. This is not a problem about a person. This is an issue of system training and assuring a baseline uh, amount of knowledge among all the relevant stakeholders. Inconsistent knowledge among community-based providers also exists in terms of serving people in the criminal justice system. Uh, and we see this problem a lot in community-based providers across the country. Um, too often they want folks to be further along than they are in order to provide treatment or they terminate them uh, perhaps more quickly than the research would suggest they should given where that person is, given the particular issues they are facing in terms of um, criminal justice. Again, this is not a knock on providers. This is an issue of needing a baseline amount of appropriate information and training across all of the system actors that are involved because of the complexity of the people you have in the system. There's a lack of resources as well to address geographic disparities in behavioral health services. And there's a lack of resources right now to increase information sharing in order to inform supervision conditions pre-sentencing. So during phase one, we considered a number of policy options uh, that 
that uh, could be revisited. Uh, and I'm mentioning these just so you know kind of where we were starting about this. Uh, one is to use validated behavioral health screening tools for all folks who are sentenced to incarceration for any period of time and to add mental health screening questions to the supervision level assessment tool for people that are being uh, that are going straight to probation. To standardize behavioral health and reentry information policy and procedures between DOC contracted healthcare staff, case managers, reentry officers, hubs and spokes, designated mental health agencies, and other community providers, and to develop care coordination and case management protocols for the executive agencies that serve people with behavioral health needs who are under DOC custody. Um, and uh, for an increase in increasing information sharing policy option for felony probation cases, explore how risk assessment and behavioral health information can be efficiently provided to judges before sentencing to better inform supervision conditions. And so what that all came down to is in terms of our suggesting that there are several critical areas for investment to rem um, that are remaining in order to support the justice reinvestment outcomes, we basically uh, at this point are recommending this, that there be the establishment of a protected, dedicated fund to support evidence-based programs and services that reduce recidivism and improve behavioral health among criminal justice populations. And to be clear, when we say behavioral health, we mean both mental health and substance use. And so given that, we're suggesting, first of all, that there be um, that the state maintains investments in domestic violence intervention programming. Uh, earlier, people were talking about the issue of domestic violence. Much of the violence in Vermont is domestic violence. And uh, simply holding those folks will not lower your domestic violence. There needs to be effective responses to the individuals that are committing such behavior. And so we are recommending that some money be put toward the continued support for the Vermont Council on Domestic Violence, statewide intervention programming, and in fact that the programming uh, over time needs to be expanded. And, and again, folks are working on this, uh, but that be expanded because domestic violence offenders are not one type of offender. They are several types of different several different types of offenders. And so there needs to be a, a set of different responses depending on which particular type of offender we're talking about. We also recommend that some of that money be put in because there needs to be a reliance on fee-for-service funding. That's not to say that somebody who's committed an offense shouldn't have some fiscal responsibility or should have none at all, but that in reality, programming cannot get to where it needs to go if you're going to rely on fee-for-service. It just will not happen. Uh, you cannot raise that amount of money through that process. Secondly, we're recommending um, several hundred thousand dollars to target gaps in behavioral health services both expanding mental health services for the non-SMI population who still have significant needs um, and for people with co-occurring disorders with both mental health and substance use needs, um, as well as uh, explore providing additional counseling services for people who are receiving medication assisted treatment. And then the third uh, bucket, if you will, the third suggestion is to put some money toward increasing data-driven decision-making. Again, I heard some of this this morning there has to be an improvement in, in the ability to collect, analyze, get out, meaning uh, extract, and share data. And then finally, our recommendation in terms of these in, this initial set of recommendations, if you will, is really strengthening transitional housing options and efficacy. And, and this is complicated because we know that there's not a lot of extra housing in Vermont, but there's a couple of things that go on. Right now, even much of the housing that exists doesn't actually match the needs of the folks that you have. So part of what needs to happen is some training to increase providers' adherence to best practices. There needs to be uh, an, an improvement in what it is that is required of folks that are providing housing. Uh, and again, this is not an issue of bad folks. This is an issue of we need to match what we have available to what the needs are of the people that we are serving in order to increase their potential for success and to improve community safety. 
And so part of that is suggesting creating a funding pool to decrease the risk for those landlords who are participating and to explore uh, assessment tools that do exist currently to better identify housing needs for the corrections population. So that is, um, that is what I presented last week to the oversight group. And uh, these are our initial recommendations in terms of uh, investment or reinvestment. And I will now unshare my screen uh, and give it back to Senator Sears. Thank you very much, David. That's an exhaustive report and I'm sure there's a lot of questions. Um, but in order to get to hear from everyone we've got on the list for today, um, going to um, try to move forward here, but if there are urgent questions or something that you need clarification on, feel free right now. Senator Lyons, you're muted. You're unmuted. No, I'm not. Thank you. Uh, no, I, this, and this is terrific. Uh, I think you've really identified uh, so many needs within the system, not simply within the system for uh, behavioral health needs in our corrections, in the area of corrections, or for those who are going out on parole. But you have also uh, connected in with our, our health care system overall, and some of the work that we're trying to do with mental health patients, whether or not they are um, being adjudicated or in corrections or being released. So um, everything from the uh, all payer model fee for service uh, to an uh, integrated care coordination system. And the one highlight I think that is absolutely critical that I, I'm not sure has uh, came out. And that is, as we're trying to share information in our state, uh, particularly with our designated agencies between and among, and then with our uh, state agencies the IT systems are not, are not consistent, they're different. Uh, and, they, and the ability to collect data and to share data is just not there. So one of the things that we talk about in our health and welfare committee is how do we make an, uh, a seamless care coordination system? You know, and it's regardless of, of who it's for, but in this case, I think uh, absolutely critical uh, and that does include some of the uh, community services for our DAs in particular. But so there's a lot more there, but I really wanted to say that uh, thank you. And you have um, certainly identified some weak points. And, uh, and it, I think it's gonna be our job as we listen to folks to um, structure some of the solutions. And so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Others? I, again, thank you, David, for the, oh, Senator Hooker. Just, a, a, I'm curious to know, Mr. Diamora, uh, do you have like best practices from other states as far as sharing? Um, yes, uh, in fact, uh, and, and we've uh, shared some of that information, no pun intended, but we've shared some of that information uh, with the folks that we're working with. Uh, but, but there are a number of states, uh, Arizona, Colorado, Connecticut, uh, where I live, that, that have developed uh, appropriate mechanisms. Obviously, you also have to adjust for state statutes, uh, but, but it, is, it is a doable process. Um, so it doesn't look exactly the same in every state. Uh, and, and there have to be protections in place. I, I want to be really clear about that. But, but there are ways to share appropriate information uh, and specifically for those people who are on supervision. When people are on criminal justice supervision, the authority of the supervising officer to uh, work with that person and have, uh, have them sign the appropriate sh information sharing releases, et cetera, is significant. It's, it's different than the person who's just generally in the community who's not under criminal justice supervision. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I just one comment, David, and that, that was, um, I think it was back on page 17, talked a little bit about folks who don't rise to the SMI level, who are in corrections, who are not as well connected to designated agencies as others. Does that have to do with 
recognition of a problem or the resistance to treatment that we frequently see with corrections populations, or is it the designated agencies? Actually, it's neither, and I'm so glad you asked because I, I did, won't, don't want to infer the wrong thing. It has to do with hard decisions being made given what the resources are that are available. And so what happens is that you, rightly so, will end up targeting what are the most serious or the, the highest need individual. And, and that's a right decision to make when you have no choice. The problem is, is that being in that position then causes those folks that you have no choice but to not respond to in the same way uh, fail at a higher level, not because of the particular issue they have by itself, but because of the impact that issue has on all the other behavior change components that you're trying to put in place. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, Representative Emmons, and then we'll... Um, so I have a question. It's on page 20. <clears throat> which really dealt with the interagency collaboration and information sharing, where you emphasize that you really need a community supervisor to really help coordinate all of that within the case. You had the circle there with the least lead case planner, which is a community oh, yes. supervision agency. Mm -hmm. Do we have that? Did you see evidence that we have a community supervisor? Or yes, and, 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 and who yes, and, who would that be? What entity would that be? Um, thank you. You've just shown me that we need to add a word to that uh, slide to make it clearer. Because when we say community supervisor, what we mean is the probation or parole officer. Um, the probation or parole officer is the community supervisor. They own or should own the case. Uh, because it's their client, their probationer or parolee, and they are the people who, because that person is under their supervision in the community, ha went, uh, have a responsibility to be coordinating those different components. But again, that's a lot on one shoulder, and you can only coordinate what exists, and you can only coordinate those people that will respond to you. Uh, they, they don't have the ability to tell other people they must. Uh, but in, in, when somebody is on community supervision, that lead person has to be the community supervisor because they have that dual role of public safety and client success. And it is a dual role that they, that they always have to have. So they're the ones that would be coordinating all the community services that would be needed for the person under supervision in the community. Are you finding... And Go ahead, I'm sorry. Are you finding situations where some of the community providers do not want to participate because it's sure. a corrections person? Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, it's inconsistent across the state. And, and, I, and I saw some really incredible things. I saw one, I saw one situation where that, that officer's connection with the housing folks and the, and the mental health folks and the substance use folks and what was happening around this complex case with this particular client was amazing, and, and I saw several of those. And then I saw others were, where officers um, were struggling because either they couldn't get the response from the persons that they wanted to in the community, um, or it simply did not exist. And, and so it wasn't that they weren't getting, I and mean, they weren't getting it because no, nobody was trying to be difficult. They weren't getting it because there was nothing there to get. And I'm wondering for those situations where the community support entities did not participate, they existed but didn't want to participate, is because the person was under corrections and it was the connection so, with having to deal with an offender. Yeah, I, it's, I think it's complicated and, and I don't want to put, uh, I don't, it's not fair to put it on any agency. My my experience broadly with community mental health broadly across the country is that many of those agencies don't realize that a large majority of their clients have actually been justice involved. They may not be at that very moment, but, but that they actually are already treating the population. 
Um, and so they, they end up with, there's this false dichotomy between the person who was just as involved and now on their own versus the person who's just as involved and connected. Um, that's one. And then the second issue is that, uh, and again, I'm speaking generally, I'm, I'm not picking on a particular agency. The second issue that I see is that um, the attitudes of people who are under criminal justice supervision sometimes are not as uh, uh, involved and motivated as we would like them to be. And uh, so, so what happens in those instances is that they sort of get terminated or not involved with because they're not motivated. My argument as a clinician, my argument is that part of our job is to figure out how to get those individuals motivated. Um, that you meet them where they're at and you figure out how to pull them in. Uh, and again, there's, you have folks that do that very well in the state, but it's inconsistent. And one of our recommendations that's not a fiscal piece, but is something we can help with is some cross system training between community providers, Department of Correction folks, other AHS departments, et cetera, to really create this baseline construct and understanding of this is the population we're dealing with. This is how we all fit in this together. And did you find any situations where a person could not access services from a community provider because of lack of insurance? Um, health insurance or being able to pay? I don't have an answer for that. I, I did not, um, but we have somebody else who was doing a broader scope of the community agencies. And uh, I'm more than happy to check with Sarah and get that information if that exists and forward that to you and let you know the answer to that. I don't have that information. Thank you. Muted. You're muted. I'm muted, um, which is probably better than not being muted. <laughs> Next um, is Kelly Doherty and uh, Anthony Fons, who are with the Department of Health, Alcohol, Alcohol and Substance Abuse Programs. And I want to thank both of you for all your work during the COVID situation. Kelly, you particularly have been drawn in different positions in different directions for the last almost seems like a year. Yes. So thank you for your time. Yeah. I'm muted. Kelly, do um, you or Anthony want to comment on the report? Sure. Um, you know, I think that overall, um, and we certainly appreciate the the kudos on the work that we're doing with people with MAT, um, but recognize that's only a subset of the folks that we're working with um, uh, who have substance use issues. And um, I think that overall our access to outpatient treatment for uh, folks for substance use treatment is is pretty good. You know, I think that we um, enjoy more success in getting people into substance use treatment than perhaps um, on the, the mental health only side, but we certainly, um, you know, continue to have work to do. And we're actually um, taking a serious look at our treatment system right now um, and are planning sort of like a system um, system reform over the next couple of years, one of the goals of which is to improve access and coordination of care. Um, one of the things that I'd like to highlight just in terms of the um, information sharing is that, you know, as you all know, it really is dependent on the person consenting to have their information shared. And I think that um, that can sometimes uh, get in the way people may be fearful of sharing information because of any potential repercussions that could happen um, based on what's happening for them in, in their substance use treatment or perhaps relapse. So um, just something to keep in mind that, um, you know, it's a, it's a voluntary information sharing. They have to consent to that. And I'll uh, 
pivot to Tony and see if he has more that he, he'd like to share from his perspective as, as one of our clinical leads. <clears throat> So thank you, everybody. Thank you for having us. I actually just wanted to say thank you to David and the folks from the Council of State Government for their inclusiveness in uh, the development of this and really looking at helping us identify what were the systems ga gaps. I mean, I think we, and Senator Sears, you'll remember this, Ms. Emmons, you'll remember this. We had, I think in years gone by where we had spent a lot of time doing cross-training between the Department of Corrections and our outpatient treatment providers, particularly back in the late 2009, 10, 11, 12 range. And I think that that was very successful at the time, but as we know, we have a workforce that turns over quickly. And so I think that the figuring out both, how do we do cross training so that we recognize kind of what we know and what we don't know about folks that work in the criminal justice system so that we can come up with a better operational format. And then how do we also maintain that as clinicians move, people change, roles change, um, so that we end, actually end up with a criminal justice capable workforce that's sustainable. I'm going to start off with one question for both of you, I guess. Many of the corrections clients that you're working with are not as motivated as other others may be. And how does that impact the ability of the community provider to provide the services? I know um, back in the day, I used to force kids to go to treatment, just assuming that <laughs> at least they were sitting there, they might get something out of it. But, um, I wonder if you could comment on that because that is a problem with many of the population. Yeah, I think that I'll start and then and then uh, Tony can chime in. But um, you know, one thing we know about substance use treatment is that um, the person has to be sort of ready and willing to fully engage in treatment in order for it to be successful. So, as much as we would like to. Um, uh, mandate treatment and force people to go to treatment, it's, it, their success in treatment is really dependent on where they are in, in the cycle of their disease and how ready they are to, to receive that treatment and be open to it. So, um, so that's certainly a challenge. Yeah, I would say much the same way as, as David described it, I think, um, it's figuring out what are the appropriate strategies. For some people, the strategy really is to develop a treatment team between the treatment provider and the, the Department of Corrections personnel who can actually then help, I guess I'd call it positively coerce or, or you know professionally coerce folks into a positive engagement, knowing that treatment for many, particularly in the criminal justice system or substance use in general, is very difficult. Most of these folks have a history of trauma. They don't necessarily want to disclose it. In some ways, it's easier to not disclose those things, but in order to kind of move forward over time, having that kind of positive pressure to keep them engaged and also to be able to modulate the treatment to where it becomes appropriate and really kind of expect and accept what people can do based on the period of time they're in and the phase of both their substance illness, but also the phase of just their general life availability as, as it is. So it's a struggle. It's a struggle in some places, less so because of the working relationships between the Department of Corrections and our providers. And in other places, it's more of a struggle because there is a, um, an anima and an animas where they don't necessarily see themselves all necessarily on the same team. Other questions for Kelly or Tony? Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you Ms. for having us and thank you to David and the team for all of your work. It's really um, enlightening. Commissioner, you, um, Commissioner Baker, you're next, but you also have a team of uh, senior probation officers, probation and parole officers with us and um, however you wanna handle this discussion. Yeah, I think just, I'm just going to make a couple comments, Senator, and I'm going to let um, the two senior 
um, probation and parole officers talk about their experience. Um, first of all, I, I want to echo what everybody else said. Um, David and the folks from CSG have been uh, incredible in giving us guidance at corrections, and we appreciate that. And, uh, you know, David sets this conversation up very well in the sense of that's the statistical data about the returns and the number of folks that have underlying substance abuse problems and or uh, mental health issues that may not, you know, especially the folks that don't rise to that level of a major mental health issue. And in particular, when we take someone into the system that doesn't go to jail, but enters the system directly in the probation. And um, I, I think that um, that's a place where we can catch um, on a screening situation, folks that we may be able to get help to to prevent them from um, bouncing around inside the system for a period of time. Um, so. The last thing I'll say is to, to the committee is that we've been talking about this for a while and it's not a reflection on any anybody or anything, but it goes directly to what David was saying. Every system needs, um, if, if we're gonna be successful at having a more robust community-based correctional system, every system that supports those people we supervise, including ourselves, um, Need, need to um, take a look at the areas we can improve on. To have that wraparound type of service that we need to prevent people from going back into jail or in the case where they haven't been to jail but they're being supervised on probation, that they don't end up getting um, trapped in the system, um, running around and not have the kind of outcomes that we all wanna have. So with that said, I'd, I'd like to not even, uh, uh, we're gonna skip over Dow because as the commissioner, I have, I have the ability to do that. <laughs> um, I want to introduce um, two of uh, what I consider to be outstanding Vermont Department of Corrections employees, uh, senior probation officers. And um, it's uh, first of all, senior probation officer Lena Watt, who's uh, in the Springfield office. And then uh, Kathy Espinkorski, who is um, in the Hartford office. And I'd like to introduce them and let them talk to you a little bit about their reaction and their experience on the ground. Because I can tell you the stories, but these are folks um, that lay in bed at night worrying about the clients that we supervise that we're not getting the services they need. And so with that, uh, I'm gonna pass it on to Leona and Kathy, and I appreciate the work they do every day. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Leona and Kathy, uh, nice to have you with us today. Thank Please, you. Uh, I'm sure you have some things that you want to let us know and uh, feel free. Okay. Kathy, do you want to start? Sure. Okay. Um, I think it's, it's great to follow up on the report that Mr. D'Amato made because I mean, so much of that really rang true um, with my experiences and, you know, it's, and I guess just to start that these are really complicated cases and um as the commissioner mentioned, you know, when somebody comes into our system from in perhaps probation, we have very little information to work with. And we can only, you know, supervise to the conditions that we have. So um, mental health needs usually aren't recognized in the court and they can be such a driving force of, you know, what that person needs to be successful. So, um, you know, the idea of being able to have assessment on that front end is um, very appealing. I think that that would cut through um, and help us get people started out on the right foot instead of having them flounder and you know that eventually we kind of catch on to what's happening with them and try and get them the services that they need. But you know on probation, if they don't come in with uh, conditions that allow us to require those kind of services, we're still you know floundering a bit with that. Um, and, you know, just the importance of all of our agencies working together. Um, I um, don't know how much to say up front because I, I have a couple cases that do keep me up at night. And, um, you know, it's it, they're very hard to work with people when you see how much pain they're in and um, that you can't get the help that they need. 
of getting them hooked up with that. And, um, you know, I think of, I, I supervise a lot of women and um, a lot of those folks have a lot of underlying trauma and um, it really interferes with them being able to get to, to move forward. And in that they end up sometimes reoffending, sometimes being returned to jail. Um, and it just is, it's hard to keep them on track and, and, and not make them a victim to our system and get stuck in jail or picking up new charges. Um, I have a woman who I've supervised since she was 19, she's 25 now and low level crimes. Um, she started on probation. She went to furlough. She's gone back and forth to jail numerous times. Um, she's designated SFI when she's in the facility. And on in the community, she does receive um, CRT services, uh, community rehabilitation treatment, which offers a lot. And, um, you know, one of the things that occurs to me is I, I, I wish that there was a way to um, kind of coordinate those two designations so that if somebody, whether somebody's in the facility or in the community, uh, they can have continuity of care and um, the intensive services that they need. Understanding that it's an expensive undertaking, especially in the community, the, the woman that I supervise um, that's CRT eligible has two case managers, her psychiatrist, um, all of the supervisors in our community mental health office are, are involved in her case. And even at that level with that many of us, um, it's hard to keep her on track. Managing her medicine um, is something she doesn't do well. And, you know, that's hard to get oversight of, of that issue, which I think applies to a lot of people um, that are in the community. And um, so that's also something that I just kind of wanted to make a, a, a plug for. So when, some, when she goes back to jail, the community involvement stops and then um, she often decompensates in jail. So it's a tough decision to put her back. The decision, um, you know, one of the things we haven't talked a lot about is just the community safety aspect of things. And that for people who have mental health issues, um, a lot of times we get calls in our office from concerned neighbors, um, family members, wanting us to do something about the situation if somebody's you know decompensating or in a manic phase and um that's where it's hard sometimes to have to draw in the mental health folks because people see us as the ones that are, are immediately available to respond and um i guess that i'll one other thing and i get leona to weigh in on on, on these issues, but the criteria and process of getting someone into a mental health hospital is really um, difficult. I can tell you, I, I mean, I can't even count how many times I've sat with this particular individual in an emergency room trying to get her processed and evaluated for um, residential hospitalization. And um, the process takes a long time. Um, she doesn't do well sitting in an emergency room. Um, she's flagged every at every hospital in our area. And as soon as she walks in, they usually call law enforcement, which then triggers her and causes more of a, um, her getting more out of control. And um, I've seen times where she's gone and sat there in the emergency room waiting for evaluation to have her evaluated and then be told to go home and they'll call her to say whether they have a bed or not. Um, and it, in that process, you know, it's um, traumatizing to her. I think it's traumatizing to our staff. And it's um, some, there have been times where she's gotten more charges trying to go through that process because she doesn't respond well when the police come. So um, that's a, another complicating issue. Fiona, do you wanna? Chime in. I, I would, and before you do, I, I just want to hope that um, Morning Fox and uh, Karen Barber from the Department of Mental Health are with us today, and hopefully they can comment on that type of experience um, and how we can 
move forward when, to improve those situations when they're uh, when when they're uh, up for discussion. So thank you for raising that. Thank you for being here, and thank you for raising that issue. We own it. Happy to have you. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Um, uh, Representative Evans was excited that somebody from Springfield was actually. <laughs> yeah. Yes, she is very very good. <laughs> Thank Mr. you. Perfect. So um, one of the main things when I saw the title of what this hearing, this portion of the um, committee hearing would be about, about mental health and substance abuse and how that affects people being reincarcerated. It is one of our biggest driving forces of why a lot of our people who are on furlough, on probation, on parole, end up back in jail. I want to emphasize just, at, just in my office, in the Springfield Probation Office, our the jail is the last resort it's the last resort of saying we have nothing left in the community for this person who is suffering through a mental health crisis that's resulted in new charges is suffering through a substance abuse crisis that have resulted in new charges or is using so badly they're going to die and so we're at this point of a lockstep of I was so excited about that report by Mr. DeMora about, you know, all the things that he, the plan, you know, the, I like that kind of blueprint plan. That's great because what we're missing right now in Vermont is long-term treatment. We have people who have horrible substance use disorders. They've been using for 20 years. They go to treatment Valley Vista or they go to Serenity House and they stay there for two weeks. And then they get released and we're sort of like, I don't know if I can make the correlation between like in a two week vacation. That first week is just trying to get read, get decompressed from working. And then that last week is like, okay, I'm going to enjoy the vacation now. This is sort of the same thing with treatment. Two weeks is just not enough for people who have been abusing drugs for over 20 years or for 10 years or however long. If they are, are suffering through that addiction, a two week treatment is just not long, it's not enough. But I think we've talked about that before, um, but the long-term treatment is one of my key things for a lot of people on, on my caseload. And then talking about effective crisis intervention, where we have, a, um, we have HRS in our community, but they're spread thin. And sometimes we just, we know when we go for crisis intervention, that person's going to be sit, sent back home and we worry about what will happen next. So I think one of the things we're talking about is having clients seen as soon as possible when they're suffering from a relapse or going through a mental health crisis. So um, I just really want to just emphasize about, we're here for our clients. That is our job. We wouldn't be doing this job if we didn't care about what happens to them. And I have so many examples of some of my clients, you know, one of my guys was released from a two week um, treatment facility. And I, got, I received a call saying, Leona, he is out on the ice, on the ice lake and he's in, intoxicated. And in my heart, I'm just like, I don't want the police officers to be harmed, but I also don't want him to die. So it comes down to these real life and death moments. And that is one of those moments where it's like, he's either going to go to jail or he's going to stay in the community and die because there are no resources for him because he can't go back to the two week treatment because they don't let you go back to um, Valley Vista or Serenity House when you've just been released. So when it comes to jail, I am so excited about the changes for JRI because, you know, yes, it's great to have people out of incarceration and back in the community, but we need the services <laughs> to be able to help those who do suffer from substance use disorders and have mental health issues because January and February are going to be big months where a lot of things are happening and there are going to be a lot more people on community supervision, but we need the resources to be able to help them because currently, in my area, we do not have the resources. We do not have the psychiatrists to treat those who have severe mental health issues. And I just really, 
I'm just going to relate this story really quickly because it's going on noon. But I just remember being in court and I had a young man who had just tried, you know, I call it tried to kill himself, but he was suffering and he was using drugs heavily. And we arrested him and we were in court. And I told the judge, I said, Your Honor, Mr. X is suffering. We have nowhere to place him. If he goes back home, he will die. And I remember the day the judge just looked at me. He was like, Miss Watt, it is not our job to save his life. And he released him. And I remember sitting there and it's, that kind of stuff can deaden you. But I remember sitting there and I said, you know what? This is not going to be the end. And something I say to all of my clients who are suffering from mental health illness or substance use disorder, I say to them, as much as I can as your probation officer, because I'm just me, I will do whatever I can to help you stay alive. I will do whatever I can to help you. Even though we don't have everything we need, I will fight for you. So I want that to be something they'll always remember. And when they're suffering, when they're going through the worst things in their lives and they're using or committing crimes or whatever, Leona said she will do whatever she can within her small bubble that I do have. I would do whatever I can to help them. So I'm just asking that we meet the need. We're going to have a lot more people in community supervision come 2021. We need the services. We need the long-term treatment. We need more services in the community to meet the need that is coming for us already, coming for us in 2021 and that we currently have right now. Thank you. Um, really uh, helpful to hear your perspective. You're out there in the field working both of you. So, uh, Commissioner, any comments that you'd like to make or Dale? Um, and or committee members, any questions? Uh, Commissioner, you couldn't have brought two better voices for. Well, you know, I'm sitting here, Senator, listening, you know, um, to the work that they do. And uh, some people have asked me, remember, I was supposed to be here 120 days, Senator. Yes, that I remember. Last, that. That, was, that was last April, but I'm still here. And uh, I, I don't want to make this too, too embarrassing for Kathy or Leona, but the reason why I'm still here is because of the work they do. Thank you. Thank you. We're glad you're here. <laughs> I think we all are, frankly, Mr. Interim Commissioner. Um, I'm going to hold on to the interim title, though, Senator. Uh, <laughs> probably <laughs> help. Well. Like I said, <laughs> it, if you look at nationwide, the length of service of corrections commissioners, you're already above many. <laughs> Well, I just want to reemphasize what Kathy and Leona said. I'm very familiar with the case that, case that Kathy was talking about. Um, I've been tracking this case. It's, uh, you know, that, that young lady that Kathy's talking about is exactly what Leona talked about. Um, if we leave her out there, she's going to die. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm, just, I'm being I as blunt as I can be. Yeah, one of the things that troubles me and has for years is that we use jail as a place of last resort because we don't have the residential treatment available either for those suffering from significant substance abuse issues or significant mental health issues. And for whatever reason, they can't get what they need and they end up in jail, which isn't, uh, isn't really the appropriate place for that. Um, but um, uh, this, the, the description of, as institutional last resort is so, Senator, I think I don't, I don't want to cut Dale off, but I know you're all short for time. And we've taken a lot of time today, but I thought it was important that you heard from people on the ground. And again, Kathy and, and Leona, they, they represent the best of what Corrections has to offer in the field. And uh, I thought it was important for you to hear it. But uh, I, 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 appreciate I think the entire, I speak for the entire committee. I'm very impressed. Thank you for bringing Thank both you. of them here. Thank, thank you for your work. Thank you for giving us the time. Thank you. Um, uh, next up, are there any questions for either Leona or? Uh, let's see. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next witness is Matt Valerio. Um, and Matt, um, you've heard some of the testimony. Are you still with us, Matt? There you are. <clears throat> Yes, I, I, you know, there's 
nothing that I would dispute, obviously, in the in the testimony that uh, that I've seen. It's something that I've seen over 30 years of being in the criminal justice system, working as an attorney. Um, I know that the it really boils down to a, a few different things, and we have some specific concerns um, that you know, are exacerbated by the COVID crisis and the response to keep people safe and healthy um, in facilities and out of facilities. Um, and then there's the, the in general sort of issues that have been discussed um, by the folks from DOC. Um, we have concerns right now about the mental health of clients uh, in facilities. Um, what is necessary to keep them physically safe um, as a result of COVID is something that is exacerbating um, pre-existing mental health conditions that are that they come into facilities with. Um, it is it's the kind of thing that also uh, brings up and causes um, new con conditions to arise because you know if you if you have it like a general understanding of uh, of you know segregation rules in in a facility in the in the normal course, we don't segregate people for very long uh, because we understand the impact that it has on their mental health. Um, and when they come in with mental health and you know co-occurring issues with mental health and substance abuse, um, it's it's even exacerbated. Um, the uh, so we have concerns about the mental health within facilities. Um, and the impact that COVID specifically and the ability to keep people safe is having on those conditions. Um, we also um, share the concern about uh, community resources for mental health, both in the lo long and short term. Um, much of what attorneys do in attempting to resolve cases so that uh, jail is not the only option for them is that uh, the attorneys and investigators in my office work with DOC and others to do th really uh, three major things. One is to find uh, treatment resources that are willing to accept them. The second is to find them a place to live. And the third is to make sure that they have food available um, while they're handling their, uh, um, their treatment needs. Um, the, uh, you know, that is something that is very common and part of the general practice that really is much different from when I was in private practice um, as, as an attorney. Um, but it's something that is the very common in the, uh, and, and almost in most every case, part of the resolution um, to uh, uh, cases in the public defense system, because obviously we have inherently, we have people who are indigent uh, who don't have resources and don't know how to access resources. And so on the front end, we're trying to do that. And then DOC picks up the ball and attempts to access the very same resources and to keep them accessing those um, resources so they don't end up back in the criminal justice system. I'm struck by the fact that, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know why I'm spacing his name, but uh, during the Shumlin administration, the, the secretary of AHS said, you know, kind of blatantly and directly in a, uh, uh, in an interview on, uh, on TV that, you know, unfortunately Vermont is put in a position where we have to house our uh, mental health population in, uh, in uh, the Department of Corrections because we don't have any place else to put them. Um, and while that was a, that was something we've kind of all, always known, um, it was a, kind of a stark, uh, reality that hit, hit us over the head, um, after, uh, Hurricane Irene, um, that, uh, when the main facility we had basically gets washed away, um, our situation with, with mental health and with uh, substance abuse and treating those issues during this particular time are, are even more acute. And they sometimes rise to the level of uh, self-harm 
uh, sometimes rise to the level of new criminal activity um, when, when they're on the outside. Um, and, and frankly, oftentimes it does. And, you know, to some, to some degree, I, I just, I, I just don't know how you get around dealing with this without um, devoting more resources uh, to the treatment, uh, to the treatment side of things and giving them a place to be where they can be safe and address the issues. Um, I don't know where those resources come from, uh, but I know that ultimately it's not gonna be the Department of Corrections that solves these problems. It's going to be, uh, you know, other agencies of government to some degree, um, but it's not going to be DOC, even if they are the last resort when we don't know what else to do with them. One, I couldn't agree more with what you've said about not having corrections as last resort, but I'm not to get to that point. It seems like we've struggled with that for a long time. Now, one of the points that uh, both Leona and Kathy made, and I thought was was important, was the length of time. Back, I can remember back in the day, a kid was usually in a substance abuse treatment program for six months and adults for 90 days. Somehow, because of, um, I think, Medicare and Medicaid and private insurers, we said that two weeks is enough. And um, I think that that's part of our problem here, um, frankly. And I, I'm not sure how Ginny's going to solve that, but I know that the Health and Welfare Committee's been working on it. I actually, uh, you know, thanks. I was, I was going right where you ended, and that is uh, we're so precluded from investing in health care uh, with our federal dollars that. Uh, it really, um, it's becoming such a problem across the country. If we're going to extend a universal access to healthcare and make healthcare seamless, regardless of whether one is incarcerated or one is on parole, <clears throat> regardless of all of those things, uh, we need to have um, the federal dollars and a federal investment. And so, <clears throat> I'm not sure one state can do it unless they're willing to give us uh, increased dollars uh, through a waiver, or uh, we need to begin now putting some pressure on uh, our federal government. Uh, this, is a, this is a huge national problem. Uh, and, uh, you know, am I going to solve this? Sure, we're going to solve it. I'm, I'm about, <laughs> only, only in conjunction with judiciary uh, and and all, everyone here. But um, it's it is it is a it is a perplexing problem, and it forces without having the resources. It does force folks into having rules that um, are go contrary to best medical practice, and that's the two week limit. And you know how you know so we get we we get that. But we need to start thinking about sending a letter out to our congressional delegation and to CMS uh, so that we can uh, get additional funds. I, I couldn't agree more, but it, we're spending the money, whether they're incarcerated or they're in, a, in a residential treatment program for substance abuse or residential treatment program for mental health issues. And um, I think we've all seen the problems that are created by forcing some of these folks into the correction setting. Um, other questions for Matt or from the committee? Thank you, Matt. Thank um, you. Next up is uh, Mary Jane Ainsworth and um, Dean George from the parole board, um, the chair of the parole board and the executive director. So um, hopefully, uh, you, you may want to comment. You've had the advantage of listening to a lot of the testimony thus far. Thank Mary you, Jane. Jane. Yes, Dean? good to see you. Good to see you, uh, Dean. Uh, it's, um, I appreciate hearing from David again. We've had the uh, fortunate opportunity to begin working with David and some of his colleagues on some 
processes that the parole board uses and how to go forward with changing some of our um, procedures in order to come out with even better solutions. We've had a struggle over the last year, particularly with COVID coming into play, on um, being able to keep up with a lot of the violation hearings that were originally uh, presented before the board. In fact, several of them, uh, or many of them, stayed in the community for months where we would normally hear them within a 30-day period of time. And so our concerns became uh, even more difficult when we did hear these cases. And as has been mentioned, many of them are substance abuse and mental health related cases. And what do we end up doing? And the board has been evolving over the last two years in making decisions to keep people on parole and find creative ways to keep them in the community, either getting them into additional treatment programs or finding ways to uh, get them the treatment that, that they need otherwise. One of the concerns we have now is that uh, we give a quick example, if I can. We did a hearing yesterday in St. Albans. We had a young lady doing really well, has mental health issues, substance abuse issues, is on the MAP program, doing really well in the Suboxone program. But now with COVID, her mental health treatment is being done over the telephone instead of in person. And so uh, while we granted parole and she was very excited, um, we're all still very concerned that without the closer supervision that she's had up to this point, uh, is she going to fail down the road and what do we end up doing with that case? Um, some of these things we can't change until we get out of this pandemic, but on the other side of things, uh, it's great to be able to collaborate with people like Leona and Kathy, which we regularly do at violation hearings to come up with solutions that involve creative ways to keep people in the community without having to reincarcerate them and keep them on parole. Again, as I said, that one of the things the board is evolving to do is look at these solutions rather than revoke parole with the feeling that, well, they're gonna come back out on furlough and that closer supervision will manage them effectively in the community. And with the uh, Justice Reinvestment Act, we know that a lot of these furlough options are gonna go away. So we need to figure out a way to continue them on parole. And I'm pleased to see that Corrections is moving back to having closer supervision of people on parole rather than just administratively supervising them, which I think will make a big difference. So we're excited about the opportunity to work with David and his team to continue to evolve in that area and provide some additional training for the board and look forward to moving forward in January. Thank you, Dean. Um, Mary Jane, any comments that you'd like to make? I do not have any other comments than Chairman George mentioned in his testimony. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Are there any questions from the committee uh, for either Chairman George or Mary Jane Annie? Thank you both very much. That brings us to the Department of Mental Health and uh, Deputy Commissioner Fox and General Counsel uh, Karen Barber. Thank you for having us. Um, Thank you. For the record, for the record, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Uh, I'd like to just start off by, uh, similarly as uh, some of the other witnesses today, uh, by expressing my thanks to uh, David DeMora, uh, Loretta, Meredith, and others of the uh, council and state government for bringing this work and helping organize this and uh, really uh, carrying a lot of the weight of uh, helping prepare this work. So uh, enough thanks can't, can't be enough. Uh, so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, I think that uh, similar to to others, I have no no issues, no disagreements with uh, the report as as is, and and some of the recommendations. We definitely support uh, trying to help uh, minimize uh, release of information, protected health information sharing roadblocks uh, that that seem to be uh, getting in the way of. Uh, good information sharing uh, between providers as well as uh, 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 probation parole officers or even within uh, DOC as well. 
Uh, that, that definitely does seem to be an impact in information sharing, as David mentioned, uh, going both ways. Um, and uh, and that that's an issue that uh, really stands front and center. Um, and also to help uh, continue improving the, the data sharing. There's a lot of data out there. There's a lot more data that's needed to be collected. But I think uh, as we look at it, it we, we it would behoove us to try to not recreate the wheel and know what what data is in i hate the term but everyone uses it what data lives in what silo um, and figure out how to uh, make sure that that data is being shared because uh, that can only help us to inform how we move forward uh, by using that data um, and the other uh, major piece for me uh, that I, I really wanted to highlight is around uh, the training and education of providers uh, in working with people who are criminally justice involved. Um, there are some small pockets uh, throughout our designated agency where there's more strength than, than in other places uh, around that. Um, but honestly, that, that seems to be more geared toward individual interests and thus programs being developed at, uh, in particular regions throughout the state. Um, and it's not consistent throughout the state. Um, and I would even suggest that uh, that training and education uh, around providing mental health treatment for folks who are criminally justice involved is not just in the community providers, but throughout the provider system, including the inpatient uh, hospital system. In uh, going back to uh, Ms. Watts' uh, uh, testimony earlier, uh, and expressing kind of the, the difficulty uh, in trying to access inpatient care uh, for someone. Um, I think some of that training and education speaks to that. Um, I think some of the inpatient facilities feel uh, more prepared and able to address uh, psychiatric issues with people who are criminally justice involved. Others do not. Um, it's unfortunate that uh, um, I guess some would say it's unfortunate that uh, we do not have the ability to uh, force uh, a hospital to take an admission, uh, even our own state hospital. Uh, we have those debates uh, internally, uh, which are never pleasant, but uh, they are what they are. Uh, and so I think expanding that training and that, that education piece uh, around uh, particular modalities for treatment for mental health needs for folks who are criminally justice involved uh, will not only help with uh, maintaining people in the community, but will also help, I, I believe, uh, creating uh, more resources within the communities and within the inpatient system of care. Uh, you know, in all honesty, there are hospitals that uh, Pretty much will say we're not going to touch someone who's you know coming out of corrections or you know in that in that sense, whereas others are more comfortable with it. Um, and I think that some further training and education around those pieces, uh, my hope would be is that 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 changes that. Uh, as as you all know, we have a limited number of beds. We're a small state. And we you know manage what we manage, uh, but people need to be able to access those beds when they need them. Um, and generally, when people wait longer, whether it's in an emergency room or in corrections, uh, you know, I've been doing this work now going on seven, oh, surprise, uh, eight years now with the state. And I have watched uh, uh, and worked within the, the movement of people in our system out of emergency departments, out of corrections, uh, uh, out of the community. And by and far, those people that tend to wait longer uh, are complex, uh, their cases are complex, and there tends to be clinical disagreements uh, between providers, between the community providers between the, and the hospital, between the, the providers in corrections and the hospital, uh, and that's, that's when uh, uh, we have those issues, uh, is those complex cases um, that we have differing uh, uh, opinions about what is needed. And again, I come back to better training and education uh, around treatment modalities, uh, I think will, in my opinion, will help reduce some of that uh, reluctance on, on people's parts or for folks to 
uh, refer to that as, well, it's only you know, behavioral or it's addiction related, uh, et cetera. Um, is we, that is one of the things we hear about is, you know, an inpatient system having basically a, a disagreement with, say, the providers in, in corrections as to what the, the need is uh, uh, for the individual. And so um, I think those are the, the, the sticking points that, that uh, uh, happen, and, and that's probably pretty clear in uh, what Ms. Watt was, was speaking about. So. Can you help me better understand the complexity of where there's disagreement about treatment? I, I, so sure. what you're saying is the think hospital so. thinks they should be in jail on the jail, or, or is it that simple, or is it a different opinion about how to treat the case? I, I think the bottom line is that, you know, the bottom line is they don't need to be in the hospital. Uh, but the nuance in there is, um, you know, uh, it depends on the case, but, you know, in a hypothetical case, a, an inpatient facility might be saying that they believe that a person's actions are uh, are motivated uh, from a malingering type perspective, motivated to get out of corrections for a time being to get a break, uh, things of that sort, versus a true mental health crisis. Uh, uh, you know, and so you have those types of complexities uh, getting involved. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just that disagreement or maybe, you know, we have pretty high standards for uh, uh, involuntary hospitalization in the state. Uh, and it may come down to, um, you know, someone being truly very mentally ill, but uh, by the court's eyes or by screeners eyes and clinicians eyes, do they meet the level of, of being a danger to themselves or others and meeting kind of that statutory criteria uh, for involuntary hospitalization. Um, you know, it's, it's much more frequent that we see voluntary uh, requests coming out of Department of Corrections than involuntary uh, hospitalizations, uh, which, you know, is, is neither here nor there. But when you have an individual who is uh, incarcerated uh, and asked, would you be willing to go to the hospital? I, it's rare to find someone uh, who's incarcerated that would say, no, I'd rather stay incarcerated um, and, and, uh, and such. And so then the, the question does, does arise at times is the, the behaviors and actions that seem to be indicating a need for, for psychiatric hospitalization, is it truly a result of a mental illness or is it more a result of some external motivating factor? Are there other questions of warning before we go to Karen, if Karen wishes to provide any testimony? Dick, you disappeared real quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think well, actually Fox covered everything unless you have um, a specific question for me that I could help answer. Uh, Representative Hooper had a question. No. Thank no. you. Um, I just got confused. I thought that we were hearing that there is a need for expanded or additional community-based um, resources for the population that we're talking about. And then Fox, you, you started talking about the need for inpatient beds, et cetera. Um, and I, 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 I either correct me, everybody, if I'm misunderstanding, or should our focus be on inpatient? And, and I appreciate that sometimes this ends up in emergency rooms, but to me, that is an issue of right. not having an alternative. No, I wasn't, I wasn't say, suggesting at all, uh, Representative Hooper, I apologize for the confusion. I was not suggesting at all that uh, we should be investing in inpatient facilities to, to kind of resolve uh, the issues that, that we've been discussing today. I was more responding to uh, uh, Leona Watts' uh, comment about difficulty of uh, someone from corrections accessing inpatient level of care. Uh, I did make a, a dotted line uh, connection, if you will, uh, from the community to the inpatient world, just around training and education uh, for working with this population, 
but I think, you know, my focus and my comments are meant to really be about that for the community. Uh, Cause I think if, if we can do the work in the community um, and improve that work, the information sharing the training, the education, uh, all of those pieces, then we'll be avoiding people needing to go in the hospital. We'll be avoiding people returning back to corrections and, and having these issues of trying to access hospitalization, et cetera, et cetera. So sorry for that confusion. Thank you. I just just want to make sure that we're clear on the takeaway about where we need to yes. be putting the resources. Thanks. Yes. And, and um, Rep. Emmons, I, I, I don't have the agenda in front of me, so I'm not sure if there's somebody else up, but uh, Mr. Deamora, I think we had a suggestion about where we might place some resources. Um, and I'm curious about the sufficiency of the proposal. It was a total of about a million dollars, um, a portion of which, I'm sorry, I, I don't have the slide in front of me either, a portion of which would go to um, community-based mental health services. Um, can you? I, can someone comment on the sufficiency of that request to meet the actual need? Uh, what, what I will say is that th that's our suggestion about what the initial investment needs to be. Uh, we were not suggesting that that should be the total over time, but that uh, we were suggesting that there needs to be a start and that that start can't wait two or three years for the reinvestment dollars to come down. And so we were suggesting that as an initial um, investment to get these things moving and move them forward. We, we did not mean to suggest that that would be the total over time of what was necessary. Um, past that, uh, as far as what actual numbers would be, that would be outside my, my, um, my ballpark, if you will. Mm -hmm. And where, where would those dollars be put? Is that in DOC with um, supervision or would it be with the Department of Mental Health for, for additional resources in the community? I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to operationalize sure. those numbers. Yeah, so we were, we were talking about community resources. Um, I believe that all of those dollars ultimately would fall under, I don't have the slide in front of me either. I believe that all of those dollars would fall under AHS. They wouldn't fall under all under DOC um, because they're targeted in different ways. Some of that would be DOC. Some of that would be for community mental health uh, and substance use. Some of that would be for domestic violence. Um, so, so the recipients would be... Um, uh, di different, the majority of them, I think, are in AHS, but not necessarily all of them. Thank you. Got it. Any other questions? Sorry for the interruption and the technical difficulties from Bennington County today. Um, I, I don't hear any other questions or comments. This has been extremely helpful to me in helping to understand, and David, and all of you testified. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Um, Very well. And uh, uh, so hopefully we have one more meeting left before the next session. Are there anything if people have uh, agenda items they would like to see? Please let Representative Emmons or myself know. Um, Thank you all very much. Dick, Dick. Oh, yes. Just, just a quick comment. Um, I want to say, and I, I think I said it in the beginning, and I, I know that the work that David has done is so significant uh, the, uh, in pointing out not simply the gaps needed for folks who are uh, incarcerated and being released or uh, and have um, various substance use disorder needs or mental health needs. But he's also identified the very gaps and needs that we have within our system of care overall. And so as we're looking at uh, additional resources to deploy for housing or for mental health treatment, 
uh, for folks in, in custody of DOC. Um, it's going to be a negotiation, but it also allows for us to build a new way of looking at healthcare in corrections and building a system that has continuity and consistency. All, all to say that we need to do this. There's no question about it. Uh, and, and we, we want to make sure that not, we're not robbing Peter to pay Paul. That, that, that's really it. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, we'll uh, adjourn now, I guess. And uh, oh, Dave just jumped off before he made me the host. Oh, bummer. I don't know how I'm going to do this. <laughs> uh -oh. David, could you hear? Oh, oh, are you still here? Oh, great. Dave, can you make me the host again so I can end the meeting? I believe so. <laughs> uh, I think we're finishing, yeah. Let's if see. You... Or I can just end the meeting for everybody. I uh, know, so, because if... I need to end the YouTube, so I need to do it. Okay, let's see if I can figure out how to get that host back to you. That's not right. If you.